time having arise, I'm going to uh, call this meeting to order. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody that participates uh, tonight up front. Um, I do also want to thank Brockton Public Schools and, of course, the fine superintendent, Kathy Smith, uh, for allowing us to, uh, to have our first uh, quarterly informational session with all the local officials that are elected and representing the city of Brockton. Of course, we're joined um, by Mayor Carpenter, who wears two hats. Uh, he's chair of the school committee and also uh, mayor of the fine city of Brockton. We have uh, representatives from the school committee, representatives from the city council, and of course, the two Brockton representatives uh, for the Southeastern Regional Vocational uh, School, where 62% of the students that go there reside here in the city of Brockton. Um, I also uh, would like to uh, thank um, all those that set up this room tonight. This is great. Uh, the, the, uh, the AV and, and all the audio, audio is wonderful as well. So um, for those that don't know me, now, my name is Bob Sullivan. Um, and I, uh, I, many years ago, I was a student in this school. I'm a proud graduate of Brockton Public Schools. But um, I'm here tonight as, as one of the city councilors uh, and the city council president for this, this year. Um, I read something in the paper today that said this is my brainchild. Well, this, this idea might have been recommended by myself, but I'll tell you, everybody up here and those that aren't here right now jumped on it and said it's a great idea, we're gonna do it. Um, so the thought process is um, to do it uh, once a quarter. Uh, we'll do it tonight, of course, at West Middle School, and, and then we'll go to East and, and North and South just to kind of spread around the city of Brockton. And I want to thank the people that came out tonight in this lousy weather. Uh, thank God we don't live on the, uh, the western part of the state where they get about 20 inches of snow. But um, I, do, uh, I do want to, uh, as we always do in the school committee, uh, I'd like to, uh, of course, stand and salute the flag. And, and it's right above uh, Council Cruz right there, if we could. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could uh, remain standing, uh, Councilor Cruz has something to, uh, to state tonight. I actually just, uh, just fitting that this is a joint meeting of the school committee and the uh, city council. We uh, lost a great friend in Brockton today, uh, received a phone call this afternoon that uh, former Brockton High guidance counselor and uh, women's basketball coach Pat Brennan passed away this afternoon. And I'd like to have a moment of silence for him. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Counselor. I also would like to recognize State Representative uh, Claire Croning is here tonight joining us. Thank you, Claire, for being here. Um, <clears throat> really, uh, the intent of this first meeting is, and we're going to have some wrinkles, uh, rest assured on that, but the intent was to get uh, all the local elected officials together at the same table as an informational strategy session where we can share some ideas, give some updates among, among ourselves, and of course, um, you know, talk to you, listen to you, get some Q&As uh, from those here in attendance tonight. Um, and again, Mayor Carpenter and Vice Chair of School Committee, um, Tom Minicello, Attorney Minicello, and, and Mark Lindy uh, jumped on board, and I want to thank them for that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're all public servants uh, for the taxpayers and the residents, uh, and we do it for the right reasons. We're not always going to agree, but at the end of the day, I think that we're doing it to try to better our community. So um, with that being said, I think maybe the, the way we should start this tonight is to, to do a quick introduction uh, around the room, if we could, starting with uh, Councillor Azak. Good evening. Sorry I'm late. Um, I'm Shirley Azak, Ward 7 City Councilor. Nice to see everybody here tonight. Hello everyone. My name is Michelle Dubois and I am the Ward 6 City Councilor. Good evening everybody. I'm Ward 5 City Councilor Dennis Napoli. Good evening everyone. I'm Tom Monahan, Ward 2 City Councilor. Good evening and welcome to Ward 1 all of you. I am Ward 1 City <laughs> Councilor Tim Cruz. Good evening. I am Shana Barnes, uh, City Councilor at Large. Good evening, Bob Sullivan, Councilor at Large. Good evening, everyone. Bill Carpenter, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Tom Minicello, Ward 1 School Committee. Hi, I'm Judy Sullivan, Ward 5 School Committee. Good evening. Ray Henningsen, Ward 7 School Committee. Thank you to all of you for coming out this evening. I'm Patty Joyce from Ward 4 School Committee. Hi, I'm Michael Healy, Ward 6 School Committee. Oh, can I say something? Of course. That, 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 that flag is hanging backwards. That's right. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. Can you uh, go to that? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Andy Robinson, Ward 2 School Committee. Good 
evening, everyone. My name is Mark Lindy. I'm one of the two representatives from Southeastern Regional Voctec. I represent you with my colleague. Wayne McAllister, uh, representative to Southeastern Regional Voc for the past 11 years. We're also joined by uh, Councilor at Large uh, Moises Rodriguez as well. Again, since this is uh, the first of hopefully many of these joint informational meetings, um, and we will, of course, enhance it uh, moving forward. We have actually uh, a page one and a page two of the agenda. Um, but again, um, we're, we're really here for you. So um, what I'd like to do right now is, I don't know if any, any specific counselors uh, have any comments or want to give any updates relative to the ward or the duties as an art large. Um, does any, any count, city council want to? I will uh, give one update. Council Cruz. Just one update, and anybody that drove here tonight coming this direction knows what a mess West Elm Street is. Uh, within the next, well, the spring is what the state tells me. It'll be going out to bid for a total uh, rebuild. Uh, new sidewalks, there'll be stoplights, traffic lights put at uh, uh, Ash Street and at uh, down at uh, Arlington Street. And uh, it was supposed to be out to bid last year, but the state has assured me it'll be out to bid this year. And it's a state project, not a city project. So, uh, exciting news, hopefully. And uh, it's, I know how bad it was coming, driving up here. It's probably the worst street of the major streets in the city right now. And hopefully we'll be uh, breaking ground by the middle of the summer to get that repaired. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Dubois. Um, I just would like everyone to know that on um, March 20, uh, February 26th is a Wednesday evening. I'll be having a Ward 6 City Council meeting, a city um, community meeting at the Brookfield School. So that is Wednesday, February 26th at 7 p.m. at the Brookfield School. And I believe we will have Interim um, Chief um, Mr. Hayden in attendance. Thank you. Council uh, Denapoli. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Just a couple of uh, things I'd like to uh, uh, bring to your attention about Ward 5. There's three new businesses that are coming to Ward 5. As you uh, well are aware, the, the, uh, the Cumberland Farms just got their fire permit to put their gasoline uh, tanks in the ground at City Council the other night. At 684 Crescent Street, the old Maple Alleys, is good, it's going to be a new restaurant there. It's going to be called the International Restaurant. Uh, they just got approved at zoning board the other night and I gave them my blessing. So we'll have a new restaurant. Christos is gone and uh, maybe this place can pick up the uh, slack. And the other good news is Doyle's is coming to Sidelines. Doyle's restaurant known in Southeastern and also on uh, the Brockton Stoughton line uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the west side. They will be coming to uh, Sidelines. So I'm very, very pleased that we have uh, three new businesses coming to Ward 5. Thank you. Thank you, Council. I, I was remiss to say, uh, Council Ianeri uh, from Ward 3, Dennis Ianeri, uh, will be coming tonight. He was uh, a little delayed. And uh, Councilor from uh, Ward 4, Paul Stadansky, as well, is, is a little delayed. Um, one, one of the things that I wanted to do, and I did it quickly um, when inaugural day when we all sworn in, uh, just really for uh, public information, is City Council, of course, has different committees. Um, you know, you hear of the Accounts Committee, the Ordinance Committee, and I just if, would like to take a second just to, uh, to read out where, who sits on that committee. Uh, Finance Committee, of course, uh, all members of the City Council sit on that. Accounts Committee this year, Dennis DiNapoli is the chair, Shana Barnes, Tom Monahan, Moises Rodriguez, and Jace Stewart. Jace is running late again uh, as well tonight, uh, coming from Boston, but he, he will be here. Beautification Committee is Shirley Azak. Community Schools is Shana Barnes. Ordinance Committee is uh, Dennis Ianeri is the chair, Timothy Cruz, uh, Dennis DiNapoli, Thomas Monahan, and Jace Stewart. Public Safety Committee is Timothy Cruz, chair, Shirley Azak. Dennis DiNapoli, Michelle Dubois, Paul Stadinsky. The Real Estate Committee is Michelle Dubois as a chair, Shirley Azak, Timothy Cruz, Thomas Monahan, Paul Stadinsky. And the Traffic Commission is Dennis Ianeri and Moises Rodriguez. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to say tonight, of course, there's a, uh, there's a pending matter going on right now with the Ordinance Committee. Um, we can't discuss that tonight because it is a pending matter, but uh, Councilor Ianeri wanted me to let you know that as a chair, uh, he is going to be scheduling in the near future. Uh, it was continued last week, so there will be another Ordinance Committee meeting meeting and he could probably address that when he comes tonight. Um, with that, if there's nothing, uh, Council Monaghan. Yes, just, uh, <clears throat> uh, Council Rodriguez just reminded me, uh, is there another agenda which Vincentes will be talked about? And we'll yep, to, uh, that'll yep. Be, we're going to go into that in about so two I'll seconds. On, well, yeah, absolutely, Councilor. Okay. Yep, yep. Right. Um, were there anything else among the City Council? 
No, okay, thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of, we'll just call it page two um, of, the, uh, of the agenda uh, on the joint informational meeting, um, of course we have uh, Mayor Carpenter here and, and uh, agenda item is Public Safety and Police Chief. Mayor. Okay. Well, now I'll avoid commenting on the Ordinance Committee matter also, so we'll, we'll leave that one off. But I do want to give a couple of public safety uh, updates, some things that have occurred over the past two weeks uh, since Chief Hayden took over. Um, first of all, uh, on Tuesday morning, uh, he convened a meeting of about a dozen county, federal, and state law enforcement agencies that all met at the Brockton Police Station to work jointly towards uh, bringing additional resources to fighting crime in the city of Brockton. Now, obviously, some of these agencies have had operations in Brockton at times, uh, but this is the first time that they've all been brought together, including many agencies like Homeland Security and the Sheriff, who really haven't done a lot in Brockton before, to all come together, but the purpose of the meeting was how they're going to all work as a team and coordinate their efforts in the city of Brockton. It was a very productive meeting. There was a luncheon afterwards, and there's a lot of excitement in the law enforcement committee, uh, community about a new spirit of cooperation to bring resources uh, to the city of Brockton. Uh the chief has also instituted proactive police patrols, something that hasn't been done for a long time. So two shifts a day, two cruisers and a wagon are going out on proactive patrols to targeted areas uh, to create additional police presence and enforce any laws and make any arrests if they see the law being broken. Um, and we'll see more of those as we can find resources and the weather warms up, but we are sending out, uh, the chief is sending out that task force two shifts a day, every day, and it's being very positively received, particularly by the police officers who on usual day-to-day -day operations feel hamstrung that they're always responding to calls and never get a chance to do anything proactively. Um, the chief has also significantly in in increased the manpower to both the gang and narcotics detective units. Um, as everyone knows, in light of the Annie Dukin fiasco, many significant convicted drug dealers are being released back into the community and many of them are coming back to Brockton. So we've made a commitment to increase the size and the activity of the narcotics unit and also to increase the size of the detective gang unit. Uh, so you'll see even more work and more success coming from them. And finally, I've just anecdotally had a tremendous amount of positive feedback, particularly from the patrol officers about many of the other internal changes that have been made. Um, in terms, do you want me to just hit all my talks, sure, Council? Okay. Sure. Um, in terms of economic development, we had a very exciting meeting this morning at City Hall. Uh, we had about 30 business leaders from the city of Brockton uh, met in the GAI room with uh, Bob Rivers, the president of Eastern Bank, who brought with him Jim Cook, who has been uh, the main architect and administrator of the Lowell plan up in Lowell. And looking and seeing the tremendous success that Lowell has had in revitalizing their downtown, I wanted the Brockton business community and some government leaders to have an opportunity to hear directly from the people that had done it in Lowell. Bob Rivers, who's the president of Eastern Bank, actually sits on the board of the Community Development Corporation of the Lowell plan up in Lowell. Um, their presentation was very favorably received. A follow-up meeting has been scheduled, and uh, we believe this will lead to Brockton adopting, if it's not exactly the Lowell plan, a very similar model to what has worked in Lowell to um, revitalize the downtown of our city. Uh, additionally, along those lines, in the next few days we'll be announcing the first meeting of the Mayor's Blue Ribbon Panel on uh, community, urban, and uh, planning and economic development. And uh, we're looking forward to working very closely with the council. Um, to come up with the best model, best practices for a city planning office. This is a commitment to planning that the council made before I got here, uh, but I'm looking forward to working closely with the council to get a top-notch city planning office in place. It's a critical piece uh, of the redevelopment of the city. Uh, along with that, we've met with HUD to look for and I believe find funding for that Main Street Manager position, which will help us a lot with developing, uh, working with small businesses and entrepreneurs to redevelop urban business districts in the city. And finally this week, we announced 
a program for any small business in the city of Brockton who does not have a website, you can obtain one through the mayor's office in partnership with Google. And this is done in cooperation with Google and the mayor's office that they will offer a small business a free website plus one free year of hosting. And then the business will have the opportunity after year if they want to pick up the maintenance fee, they can keep the website. Um, but this is really critical to help a lot of our small businesses, many of whom may not have, would like to have a website but just don't have the capital. 97% um, of people when they shop now look online. Not that they're buying online, but they do some looking around online before they go out to make a purchase. But more than half the small businesses do not have a website. So this is something that we feel will be a big benefit for small businesses in the city. Um, and then finally, a topic that the school committee will um, touch upon, uh, but that we are working on plans to reopen the Whitman School as an elementary school. And uh, probably not for this year, but the work will begin this year to get it done next year. And right now, the school committee is just waiting for the architect's report uh, on the building. And I'll, I'll let the school committee address that one. And Council Monaghan will talk about Vicente's Market. Um, but I did approve the TIF request that will go in front of the Finance Committee next Tuesday night. Councilors Monaghan and Rodriguez have both worked uh, on that project. And I did, I've met with the Vicente's folks several times, including as recently as this morning. And I think it's in my mind is a model use of what tax increment financing is supposed to be all about. It's a project that's going to improve a gateway to the downtown. It's going to create jobs. Uh, it's going to bring back a blighted area in that uh, long vacant uh, supermarket. Um, so I'll, I'll defer the comments to Councilor Monaghan, but I, I will be supporting that request in front of the uh, City Council Finance Committee on Tuesday night. And I'll cut it off right there so the school committee can have a chance. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've also been joined uh, by Ward 3 Councilor Dennis Ianieri and Councilor Lodge Jay Stewart. And with that being said, uh, Vice Chairman uh, Attorney Minicello. Good evening. Uh, and Judy Sullivan. Oh, I'm sorry. Ward 5. School sorry, committee, Judy, Judy, Judy Sullivan. Sullivan. Yeah. Good to see you. Hi, Judy. Thank you, Patty. Um, a good evening, summary. everyone. Uh, the school committee is going to speak about several topics, and uh, we're going to basically do it in a group speak. Um, several of the members uh, who have been involved with many of the issues that are on our agenda will um, uh, participate and um, tell their story from their perspective um, in their schools, because naturally they know more about what's gone on in the schools in their ward than some of us. Um, we also are going to ask to participate on the school side, uh, Superintendent Smith, who is here. We also have with us Deputy Superintendent uh, Liz Barry, who is the Deputy Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. And we have Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Michael Thomas. So with some of the issues, uh, they will be participating as well and providing us with the value information um, that I think you'll find interesting and will benefit everyone. Um, from the school side we're going to speak a little bit about our student population. The student population here in Brockton is growing um, constantly and I, I think that's a good thing because I believe that a lot of people are coming to the Brockton Public Schools because we have a good reputation and that reputation is known throughout the state. Uh, we're also going to speak a little bit about our student population um, and the demographics, who our students are and where they're coming from. Um, also our school buildings. Uh, as many of you know, uh, most of our buildings in Brockton are older buildings. We have been fortunate to have built five schools um, that we would consider you know, relatively new, but um, you know, we have about 26 buildings and about 21 of those are very old and require maintenance. And uh, we'll speak about what's been done and what uh, needs to be done. Um, we all, we'll also speak a little bit about uh, school initiatives, what's going on in the schools presently, what uh, programs uh, are going to be introduced or attempted to be introduced, and what uh, we've been doing with some success. So, um, and naturally our southeastern regional um, partners are here and they will brief us on the uh, what's new and exciting at southeastern. I know that you've done quite a few renovations over there uh, in your high school, so that'll be interesting to learn about. But um, in a nutshell, that's what uh, we will be speaking about and the public naturally will have an opportunity for questions and comments so um, you know it should be a interesting discussion thank you mr. Mancello uh, to the council store did you did you have something to add when you, when you came in a little tardy did you want to yeah, I, I would love to actually okay do I sure yes we should yeah, my apologies.
apologies for uh, getting here a little bit late. I'm working in Boston, so traveling in this kind of weather makes it, it's always a task. Um, I know that folks sort of went around and um, gave some general updates. And one uh, piece of work that I'm excited to present to the council and frankly to the city so we can have a really in-depth discussion over it is looking at the city's charter. So as most of you are aware, we have elections every two years in the city. We have a Form B uh, type of government. There are actually multiple forms of government that you can adopt in, in Massachusetts. And so what I would like to push forward is um, the development of a committee, uh, a charter committee, uh, to look at our system of government to assess if, in fact, it's, it's um, working for us. I think the last time we had this sort of review was you know, over several decades ago. And so it seems time for this kind of review. Is our elections every two years, is that effective? We know it's expensive. Uh, we know that every election in the city is uh, over $100,000, and we're doing four elections uh, every two years if you consider the preliminary. And so it's costly. Does it give elected officials enough time to put an, uh, an effective agenda together and then to act on that agenda? So it's uh, four-year terms more effective for the city than two-year terms? Now, does the former government that we have make sense? Um, so those are things I'm hoping we can move on and discuss as a community and, and put the best thinking forward uh, looking at the kinds of results that we want as a community. So that's something that I will be presenting pretty soon. I think it will be very important and will require the participation of not just all my colleagues in government, but of course, uh, of residents. So I anticipate a fairly active and uh, vibrant discussion. I have been in talks with the chamber about this uh, resolve and, and moving forward on this. And um, Chris Cooney is eager as well to have the city uh, go through this discovery process to make certain that, again, that we're working uh, as a municipality in the best interest of our goals as a city and in, in the interest of, of residents. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Yaniri, did you, did you have anything to, that you wanted to bring forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I apologize, too, for being a few minutes late. I just left work a few moments ago, so uh, driving across town uh, this evening wasn't, uh, wasn't easy uh, either. Um, just a couple of, uh, couple of uh, announcements I would make, and uh, as everybody knows, as, as I've been the uh, counselor from Ward 3 for uh, the last 10 years, going on my 11th year, and I, I think one of the greatest assets I've always had was to be able to hold a, uh, a Ward meeting, and uh, those Ward meetings have always been successful, and, and I'll be having my uh, Ward meeting in sometime in March. It, I just didn't feel uh, fit to have something in January and February, the way the winter months have, uh, have been this year, but I will be starting uh, my Ward meetings up again uh, sometime in, in March, so I'm sure the the people that uh, are here, if there's somebody here from Ward 3, or anyone that's listening from Ward 3 uh, knows that I usually um, have a pretty good crowd there and we uh, usually try to have some um, speakers in regards to some issues pertaining to the city. So I'll be, uh, I'll be doing that uh, very shortly. Um, it seems to be the hot button topic for the city right now is the ordinance committee and when the ordinance meeting is going to be and, and those seem to be my phone calls and uh, I'll be announcing that date some, sometime next week. I'm just waiting to hear back from our legal counsel, Attorney Mark Day, because he needs to be present and uh, we had a little conflict he and I with um, a couple of dates so I'll hear back from him hopefully tomorrow if not Monday and then uh, I'll announce uh, uh, when we'll have a, uh, an ordinance meeting and just so everybody knows um, you know five members sit on the ordinance committee and uh, you know this isn't the first ordinance um, that we've ever worked on in the city of Brockton we work on several different topics of, of ordinance and even Council DeWild knows that what we just went through uh, just last year with six seven months of just trying to decide where uh, where we'd be locating the the marijuana uh, facility and, and that took some time to do. So no ordinance are done within 24 hours or 48 hours. They're always done within sometimes maybe two months, maybe less than, maybe three months. But we're working feverishly to get this, um, this particular one accomplished. So um, again, I'll have a date for that uh, next week and then we can proceed with that. Thank you, Council. That, I'm, I'm pleased that we're having this type of a meeting and uh, look forward to listening as well. Thank yeah, you. I mean, it's, it's historic. This has never happened. So uh, I also want to recognize State Rep Mike Brady's joined us tonight. Thanks for being here, Michael. And uh, before we get into the, um, the items on the school committee side that Mr. Minoncello talked about and, and both Mr. McAllister and Mr. Lindy, uh, uh, Council Monaghan, did you want to talk about Vincente's or Whitman School? Now, you know, I'm, I'm very biased to Whitman School because that's where I went. So I'm excited that the mayor and the school committee are doing that. So do you have anything you want to offer before we go over to our colleagues on the school committee side? Well, I'll leave the Whitman School to Andy, but I'm very happy that uh, <laughs> it's... <laughs> Actually, I was in the Whitman School, and it's kind of uh, about last year sometime, and uh, we, and they had sort of been torn apart a little bit, but there was some writing on the wall, and it had, happened to mention uh, something about Councillor uh, Sullivan. That was my brother. That wasn't so your brother, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
But I think uh, Mayor Carpenter pretty much uh, summed up uh, Vincente's. This is going to be a great project. Uh, we're going to be uh, uh, discussing a TIF uh, next week. Uh, for them. It's a TIF that's basically the same as Crown Linen got uh, in uh, WB Mason, so it's in the same uh, ballpark. Uh, this is going to really enhance the blighted area right now. It's, a, it's mostly uh, an ethnic um, supermarket, but it's for everybody, but it, it, where it's going to be right in the middle of that neighborhood, which will serve the people that really that um, it, it has everything for them. And it's, uh, it's just going to really make it look good. It's, it's going to be going right, th as we're developing downtown, this is going to be a nice little uh, gateway going right into downtown. You go down Pleasant Street, and uh, it's going to really uh, spruce it up. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, being completed. I think their financing should be uh, all settled probably by next month. And uh, I think April or May they'll be uh, they'll be starting construction. And also the uh, Neighborhood Health Center um, is going to be having some offices there. We uh, went to the zoning uh, uh, board last night and they approved the variance for them so that it can be built. So, um, and there's also possibility of a, uh, a uh, police substation being built on the property with another business. We're going to try to do something like that. So that would be another, uh, another good thing for the area. So thank you, Council. Thank you, Council. And just a point of information, when, uh, when Mayor Harrington was uh, under his administration, the City Council um, ratified Chapter 40 hour Smart Growth Zoning. Um, and, and that does fall within the parameters of the zones that we did. So that was some, maybe it was lucky foresight, but that's great that that's going to really beautify that area. And, and thanks to the Mayor on that endeavor as well. And we're joined by our colleague, uh, Councilor and former Police Chief uh, Paul Studinsky tonight. Thanks. Thanks for being here, you, Councilor. Um, with that, I, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, Mr. President, if I may. Sure. I don't know. I'm also a chairman of the uh, planning board. And uh, there will be two other buildings. Uh, at least we signed the plans. Uh, we approved the plans that uh, two other buildings will also be on that site. It will be a fast food uh, restaurant and a bank. That was the plans that we had signed, as well as the neighborhood health center, which will adjoin uh, the, the existing building. Uh, so everybody left out those two important things. I, th I think they're important. That Thank so you, it'll Mr. be a well, well developed site is what it's going to be. That's great. I wasn't aware of that. Thank you, yeah, Mr. McAllister. Right. Thank you. Um, with that being said, um, before we open up the Q&A, Mr. Mancello, do you, do you want to jump into yeah, certainly. Um, your colleagues? Sure. Okay. Well, with regard to our student population, today's number for the Brockton Public Schools is 17,425 students. Just to give people a little perspective, What's happening, the trends in Brockton are such that in 2011, the number was 16,008 students. 2012, 16,289. As of October 1st of this year, of, well, of 2013, not this year, it was 17,014, and now it's 17,425. So the good news is that kids are coming to Brockton. And you know, you hear about people leaving the state, you hear about other school systems losing student population. Well, there's got to be a reason they're coming and I think it's because, again, we do good work here in Brockton. The downside of that is that what's happening is that we have a limited number of buildings. And um, class size is becoming a problem. The school committee, several of my colleagues who have been on the school committee, we recognized that a year or two ago. Um, and we basically made a decision that we needed, especially in the lower grades, to thin out those classrooms um, because just having kindergartens come in and having close to 28 kids, 27 kids in a kindergarten class and first grade class is just too much for any teacher to deal with, plus it's unfair to the kids. So there was a decision made, the school committee um, together with administration and the city um, because the city contributed some funds to do renovations over at the old B.B. Russell. It's now called the Barrett Russell. And what we decided to do was to make that a kindergarten center. And by doing that, what does it do? Well, we were able to remove some of the kindergarten classes from our existing elementary schools, have a nice kindergarten center over at the uh, Barrett Russell building. It's a beautiful building. I would suggest that people, if they have an opportunity, if there's an open house, to go and visit it. Um, 
and it's a really great place for just kindergarten students. There's almost, uh, it's getting close to 300 kids over there. It's 279 or something like that. So um, it's, becoming, it's becoming a popular stop. But um, that is an ongoing trend with Brockton. And, um, and we already have this year, as opposed to last year, another 400 to 500 new kids. Well, the Hunting, just to put things in perspective, the Huntington School has 465 kids in that school. That's an elementary school. So, um, you know, there was some mention about we're looking at the Whitman School. Um, and that's in Andy's ward, Ward 2. Um, because we see we're going to be, again, short on classrooms. So we have to do some long-term and short-term planning. So the Barrett Russell Kindergarten cent Center was a short-term fix, and we were able to turn that around pretty quick. But with respect to the Whitman, um, it sounds great to perhaps bring it back as an, as an existing school, but you know, we have the architects and the engineers looking at it. It's going to have to be brought up to code. And to bring a school like that up to code, guess what? Needs an elevator. Well, an elevator is a $500,000 cost. So um, I don't want to um, dissuade people and have people think that this is a done deal by any means. It's an option that we're exploring, but we have a lot of factors to deal with. Naturally, finances are going to be a big cost factor. So, um, but we see this ongoing trend. We see that you know our classes are getting bigger again, and we're going to have to <coughs> do something about it. Um, so we have not made any final decisions, but the only decision is to explore the building and see um, what opportunity may exist for the building and what the costs are at this point. Um, Andy, do you want to talk about maybe what some of the neighbors are saying over there? And yeah, to I mean, you? certainly, you know, it was an election year, and so we're all out <coughs> in neighborhoods, and we're knocking doors, and we're talking to folks, and, and and um, the, the largest issue that I got questioned about, hands down, knocking on doors, was neighborhood schools and what's happened to neighborhood schools. The B.B. Russell, the Barrett Russell School, is also a Ward 2 um, school, and, and it's in the middle of a neighborhood. Um, and it's also connected to uh, City Park. And, and the, you know, I, I very strongly believe that us opening that school, um, not only is it a great place for kids, young, our, our youngest um, and, and newest learners to be, but it, it, it will be a good thing for that neighborhood, and it already has been a good thing for that neighborhood. Um, and, and uh, you know, the Whitman was the other question, and, and uh, it used to be, long before I was on the committee, it was a great neighborhood school. Everybody remembers the Whitman fondly. Um, and. and uh, you know, I look forward, uh, hopefully, to, to being able to find a way to move forward with these plans, um, continue to serve our youngest learners, continue to address, the, you know, all the issues that Tom talked about, but, but um, you know, put some life back, back into a neighborhood and, and put a school back into a neighborhood. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's an exciting prospect, but one, obviously, is going to have some challenges and some work ahead for us. Um, one of the things we see in um, Mrs. Joyce's area is that uh, her schools are getting pretty full. Patty, why don't you talk about the Davis and the numbers over there because you know them better than anyone. Well, the, the Davis and the Huntington both are uh, completely maxed out. We cannot accept any more children in those schools. And that's the biggest um, growth as far as population in the city right now. So uh, to touch on what Tom talked a little bit about is the short-term band-aids that we have to put in place, like the, the barrier. Russell, the Whitman. We are adding modulars to the Kennedy School. We've got that out to bid. Uh, we have five right now that we have to replace. We're hoping to add another five that gives us another five classrooms. But those are just short-term fixes right now. What we're starting to look into and look, um, is creating a, a long-term master plan, facility master plan that will help us to gain funds from the states for building, uh, possibly building more schools and or being able to retrofit retrofit existing buildings for use as classrooms. But the state is requiring us to have master plans to be able to be uh, um, eligible for funds from the state. So um, that being said, with constantly thinking forward, not just this year, next year, but the next five or ten years, because our population is not ex expected to level out anytime soon. So we know that we're going to be dealing with another four to five hundred kids every single year, and we need to have 
places to put those children. Um, so we will be working on that, adding more modules as we need, just to help us through until we can find permanent uh, solutions. Uh, as far as uh, what we've been able to do at the Davis, as well as the Raymond and some other schools, we just completed uh, a, a major green school repair program that the state funded us at the rate of, Mike, was it 90 or 80 percent? 80 percent. So we paid 20 cents on the dollar to get new boilers, new windows, new roofs, uh, especially on the Davis where they had constant leaking issues. And that really um, improved the quality of instruction and the quality of life in those schools for our kids and our teachers. So we've just completed those on several of our schools. West Middle School was one of them as well. Um, roofs not leaking. That, exactly. So it, it not only made the quality of life in the schools better but extended the life of our buildings as well. Uh, we're also, um, the facilities department, Mike, is also looking into um, another, uh, another repair initiative that we are eligible for, that we're in the beginning steps to be able to, uh, in, to replace the windows at the Barrett Russell, for instance, as well as many more improvements in other schools, that we are paying pennies on the dollar to be able to maintain these facilities and extend the life of these facilities. Um, another thing that we are uh, really um um, thinking about and planning for is uh, the new uh, state and federal uh, testing that we're going to be dealing with. The, it's called the park testing and we're expecting that to take over, to take the place of MCAS. But one of the challenges with that is that it's an online testing program, which means that we need to improve the technology infrastructure in our schools. We need to get our kids all technology um, so, uh, to get used to using technology on a daily basis before they have to take this testing. So as we go through the budget process over the next couple of years, we're going to be focusing on those initiatives, both facility-wise and uh, technology-wise, to get our kids ready for this new round of testing that they're going to be required to take. So I kind of threw a lot out there. But. Well, you got ahead of the agenda. <laughs> um, Mr. Healy is, we're fortunate to have Mr. Healy on the committee who has a, um, uh, a background in construction. Um, Mike, why don't you tell them about what you've observed over at the Ashfield, the Brookfield, and uh, the Kennedy with regard to those modulars, because um, you can describe it better than anyone. Uh, well, the modular class, I, I call those schools the baby boomer schools because of the era that they were built in. Had I grown up in Brockton, not in Boston, I would have attended those schools. Um, the modulars were added obviously because of uh, the need as the population grew in those areas Tell and modulars are. I will yeah yeah the, the modulars essentially are uh, they're basically the double wide trailers and uh, so that they were built off site like a trailer would be and then they were dropped on their foundations so they were dropped on individual footings so there's still gr there's still earth underneath them and over time that lends to uh, degradation where you know they're just plywood they're wood they're wooden buildings and uh, they have a, a limited shelf life and, and they've exceeded the shelf life uh, because of uh, diligence on the part of our uh, maintenance crews but uh, the, the buildings that lie in the in areas where uh, there's extreme amount of water, like uh, like the Kennedy, for instance, those buildings are in the worst shape. Perhaps uh, of all of them, the ones that are in the best shape are the ones that are attached to the Brookfield. Now they all have they have their own heating system and their own uh, air conditioning, so actually they're quite comfortable. You might say they're double wide. Well, you know, I don't know if any of you folks have stepped inside a. Uh, a double wide trailer but you know they have all the comforts and they're well built now the new ones will be on a solid slab of concrete and not on footings so that uh, that degradation won't happen as quickly as uh, the old ones did now um, we're in the process of leasing them because that allows us to use state money in that regard uh, to uh, uh, to do the leasing as opposed to purchasing them outright which would involve city money and uh, that's the way we're going to go and uh, we don't think at least we're hopeful that at the end of the uh, the lease that the uh, 
that the company that whoever company we choose to uh, to get these leases from, they're not going to want to pick them up. So we'll pick them up from off that we're not they're just not going to do that <laughs> so we're going to get them for short money and, and hopefully they'll have a longer shelf life than even the last ones did so uh, again it's a band-aid fix um, Alicia Clark who's a, a new uh, uh, committee member she was dis disheartened when uh, she heard that the modules were going back but as I said to her listen we have to act now and we're going to work on our long-term plan uh, in fact, it's even longer than 10 years, as Patty said. We're, we're potentially looking at a 20-year growth plan, and that's what uh, Superintendent uh, Smith would like to see happen. So we're going to begin on that initiative in, uh, in short order. So basically the moral of this story is that if in fact in another couple of years uh, we're pushing over 18,000 kids, the reality is going to be is Brockton is going to need another elementary school because what we're trying to do now is a band-aid approach. What we have, making the best of what we have. But if you're adding another thousand kids, well just to give you some perspective, the George School and the Baker School, the two new biggest elementary schools, those hold about a thousand kids. So if we're if, if we get another thousand kids in this school system and that could happen because people living on the east side know that there's a big development or the boulders are expanding the more expansion the more residential housing built in Brockton apartments uh, condos whatever brings more children so if in fact more you know units of housing are built the reality is our city's going to need more space and you know what we have now is not going to be adequate you know, come two, three, four years down the road if in fact the growth continues and, and another thousand kids come in, there's no way. You're gonna, right now we are, we are doing the best with what we have to try and maintain reasonable class size, but if, if the expected growth comes, we're going to be talking about you know a, a larger investment. Um, just to let you, um, if you look around this room, you're going to see a very diverse makeup of citizens um, here. And guess what? Our student population matches what we have here. Um, just to give you some percentages, these are these are the categories where that students identify themselves as. Our Hispanic Latino community, we have approximately 15% of our student population. So out of those 17,425, about 15% are Hispanic Latino. American Indian, not so much. About half a percent. Um, Asian, Brockton does not seem to have a large Asian population like Quincy for whatever reason. We have about two and a half percent. Um, people that consider themselves black, uh, it's about 58 percent. Uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, even smaller, um, not even half a percent. And uh, white students, about 24 percent. So basically we are a melting pot. So what you see in this room is really what we have in the schools. Um, so I think that does it with numbers. I, I hope I haven't bored you too much with student population. Um, I'd like to invite Mike Thomas just to speak a little bit about um, some of the projects that uh, we have done. Um, Mike, you want to come up to perhaps the microphone and you might want to turn around and face the audience. Um, just if you could tell, tell uh, the audience, you know. <laughs> um, there you go. <laughs> but basically, you know, tell where we've been and where we're, we're perhaps going, you know, with respect uh, to our projects. When I first came on in 2010 from Brockton High, where I was a housemaster, this is my 22nd year, um, we, um, Matt Malone at the time said, we have several buildings to fix and you need to get them fixed because the Raymond and Davis, we had over 100 leaks each in those buildings. Uh, carpets were soaked, kids were getting sick. Um, so we filed um, 12 applications for repairs across um, the city. We end up getting eight of those, $36 million worth of um, repairs um, that we filed uh, at a cost of $7 million, uh, in the to the, to the city. So the uh, city council, the mayor at the time, the, the school committee was very supportive in finding that $7 million to support those, those eight projects. I just filed um, for seven more at a cost of probably an average cost of about 
Um, 10 million again at 80% reimbursement from the state. So we won't know about those for another couple months. Um, we've tried to expand um, and do a lot of work to fire alarms. We have a big issue with fire alarms in schools. There's no programs that help us replace fire alarms. So we do that in house. We have a couple of electricians that know how to replace fire alarms. So, you know, those are issues we're working on. Um, Again, windows, doors for safety. I know um, school safety is a major concern. We spend a lot of time on um, exterior locks. We received a uh, $500,000 COPS grant that was written with the school department and the, um, the um, Brockton uh, Police Department. So we've had 500000 to uh, include, improve locks surveillance cameras, lightings at all the schools. So, and again, everybody's concerned about what's been going on with school safety and shootings across the country. So that's a major concern and that's in my area. So we spend a lot of time on that. So, um, you know, there's a lot, there's three million square feet of um, floor space in the Brockton Public Schools. And as Mr. Minicello said, that's, that's a lot of floor space. There's a lot of repairs, a lot of old schools, old buildings. As you can see, you know, wear and tear has, you know, hit all these schools and, you know, we spent, we need to spend a lot of time repairing. So, um, we're, you know, we're trying to put a lot of money into that, but also make sure that the kids are getting the education they deserve. So, um, we can take any questions if you want me to. Well, just to add one more thing, I mean, everyone talks about, oh, the new high school. Guess what? That high school ain't so new anymore. Um, if you've been up there and in there, you see how much, uh, basically, the disintegration of the cement, um, because that place was built with a ton of cement. If you drive in the parking lot, the parking lot, we, we were able to take care of some repairs to the driveway, but our parking lot isn't in good shape. Um, Mike, what does it cost? What would it actually cost to fix the rest of that parking lot? The parking lot for Brockton High to do um, is $2 million. Uh, we had estimates throughout the, I mean, I mean, if you go to the Raymond School, the Davis School, out here, um, there's probably $15 million alone in just paving work that needs to be done. So, you know, and that's, that's you know, it's a priority, but it's not something you're going to find the money to do, so it's just patch jobs. And uh, so when people say, you know, how much you need to do, just 15 million in paving. And that's not renovations of bathrooms that have to be done, interior doors, um, windows, heating systems, electrical systems that have to be upgraded. So um, there's a lot of work, a lot of work. Uh, but again, it goes back to making sure the building envelope is solid so you can uh, have the school dry and healthy for air quality and also have it safe. So that's the things we focus on is to make sure the exterior of the buildings are safe, the windows, the doors, the locks. Again, we to focus on safety and then all the other things you just try to tackle like fire alarms, electrical systems, um, bathrooms, fixtures, lighting fixtures, you know those are the kind. We were lucky that two years ago Sylvania offered a free program we were able to these are called T8 lights actually for a phys ed teacher a lot I know a lot more now than I used to know about <laughs> these kind of things. Um, they, um, we, Sylvania gave us a free, through National Grid, we were able to swap out over 30,000 um, lights, T8s they're called, and um, they save us probably thousands a year now for, you know, just switching those out. I think we received over 33,000 light bulbs and they were, they were done throughout the system, so. Um, you know, so there's a lot of work to do, and uh, we, you know, we continue to try to peck away at it and be uh, responsible as far as you, you have to be careful how much Chapter 70 money you use to, to do capital repairs. That's something the state watches you very closely on, so you have to be careful of spending a lot of Chapter 70 money on doing capital repairs, so you have to pay attention to that as well. Polly? Yes, sir. Good, how are you? I was wondering, can we yeah, they actually did, uh, years ago, they built the locker room at, at the um, high school. That is the, uh, oh, the, um, Mr. Spears wanted to know if we could use Southeastern, the students that go there to um, carpentry and electricians and um, plumbers, if we can use them to uh, do some work in the school system. They have been used before, probably about 15 years ago. They expanded the locker room that sits under um, the stands at Marciano Stadium. So I, I wasn't around when that project went on, so. 
<laughs> um, I'll speak to that. Right now, the kids are in West Bridgewater, and there's a, an ongoing list of communities, other communities, because we're, we belong to, uh, there are 10 board members. Uh, on the uh, uh, school committee, and um, you know, so we have nine different communities, uh, and each one, most certainly the little ones that have town meeting, um, they put in for work that they need to be done, and and um, so there's issues with uh, whether or not you're dealing with um, um, union um, contracts and those kinds of things, but we'd be more than glad to uh, um, you know take your proposal and and um, see what what we can work out. Um, Right now, like I said, we're in West Bridgewater, and we're doing, we'll be doing some uh, national historic work. The kids are going to be working on post and, and beam uh, um, a construction for uh, an 1800 building, and so it's uh, going to be pretty laborious and, and very educating for, for the children. So uh, I'll take it back. We'll take it back, and we'll see how feasible it is. Um, also on that note, um, when uh, Mayor Carpenter took office, I spoke to him already about the fact that uh, each community gets to request different projects, and there's a whole order in which the uh, which the uh, communities do it. There are nine communities total, Brockton being the largest one. And that example on the on the locker room. The thing you got to think about as well is um, there are certain things that the kids can't do. They can't do anything where there's any lead paint involved. They can't do anything where there's any height involved. They all have to be supervised, and like Wayne talked about, the union too. But um, the, it, when we just did our renovation over at Southeastern, a lot of the students were utilized in the project. The early ed center that was built, which was our old electrical shop, was almost done entirely by students. The rest of the building was done under the project, but the kids got to learn alongside all the all the skilled craftsmen and tradesmen. And uh, you know, we're we're a willing partner. So. We will definitely bring that back. I think. I think too, Ali. It's important. You know, we're thoughtful about these things. Both in, you know, Mike Thomas and his office and the school committee. We've we brought many of the skilled tradesmen into our staff, um, so that we house those folks. They, so they cost less. We don't have to bid out those services. Um, we've been thoughtful about what shifts we put them on, so that if you hire an electrician or a plumber, you, they can't be in the in the bathroom during the school day. So we hire them on an, on a you know on an afternoon shift, so that work can start the second the school day ends. Um, work can happen in the summer. The Barrett Russell was done almost entirely with in-house labor, um, which saved us a lot of money on that project. And so we're always thinking about thoughtful ways to to try to save money, um, and and, and thoughtful ways to kind of try to employ folks from Brockton if we can and, and all those great things. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good. Yes. That belongs um, to the city now, so I don't know, Mayor Carpenter might want to speak. Uh, the schools, to, actually, the city owns all the schools and buildings, and um, and that basically we give it to, either we have control of them, we do the work, or we give them back to the city. So the city's had control of the Howard School for ever since it's closed about four years ago now. So I know that's been up for sale, so I don't know if. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's funny you brought that up, Dave, because actually. The school committee recently just did commission a feasibility study uh, to see what the costs and, the, and, and what would be required to, to bring the Howard School back because obviously we're trying to look at any existing facilities where we might be able to create additional classrooms. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, feasibility study came back with an estimated cost of about $5 million to bring the Howard School back online. And that's because there are significant issues with um, asbestos, mold, radon, code things that have to be brought up. Uh, outdated heating system. Um, so we did have we did invest a little money in having the pros take a look at it to see what the options are, and it's it's cost prohibitive. It, it's just if for what you would have to put into it, that money would be better spent putting it towards a new school. Can I ask one? Sure. Is it possible? I saw that Cumberland Farms. Well, first of all, I think you know. Need the mic. And I'm not happy about that either. And again, it's like what happened on the south side, it's tied up in a lease. So now that's going to be vacant for the next two years, three years, four years, which is not good. Now, with Cumberland Farms now, 
is hopefully, I think, uh, Mr. Napoli said they just got the permits for the tanks. Now they're saying now they want to leave the yeah. domain. Yeah, they need That's to use them. I don't know what, what they're leaving, Dennis. Mr. Mr. President, can I address that? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, Absolutely. David, Cumberland Farms is closing the north side. Right. They're going to renovate it and it'll look like the east side. It'll be a brand new Cumberland Farms with uh, okay. gas tanks and the whole nine yards. Yeah, that'll be on the east side, but we won't have one on the north side. Yeah, the, no, the north side's going to be renovated. But I, oh, okay. they're, they're, they're closing it to knock it down. Yeah, sorry about that. It, sorry. I, I know that we're going to put one now across from the east side fire. Your Honor, is there a way that we can, if we're not going to open the school, can they take the Cumberland Farms and go there in that corner? Yeah. Is that enough? Is that we were, um, that feasibility study just came back very recently. We we're waiting to see what that looked like. Obviously, the, the Howard School actually belongs to the city nowadays. Okay. Um, so I think that we'll now look at what's the best potential future use of it and um, I would think we'd be working with the council to probably at some point put out an RFP to see if there's interest in someone that would like to buy and develop the site. Um, and I think the most critical factors there that we would look at would be what would be the benefits of the project that's proposed to the city. Not just future tax revenue, but hopefully something that would create jobs and improve the neighborhood. Um, but I. I didn't really want to go forward in that direction until the school committee had a chance to see if it had potential to be brought back as a school. But that does just not look feasible now. Thank you. Is my mic on? Hello? Can no, everybody you. hear me that no. the, the, the new, the Cumberland Farm store on the north side is going to be closed? It's going to be torn down and it's going to be like the east side. It will be a brand new store. Right. Now, can you hear me? Uh, David? Yeah. Okay. It's going to be a brand new store. David, it's going to be a brand new store. What's going to make you very okay. nice. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, I think what we're going to do, I, I want to save a lot of time for public comment and Q&A. Uh, I think I wanted to, because of course Mark Lindy and Wayne McAllister, and I, I don't know if the school committee still had some more information. I think it's very vital to open it up to the, to the public. Um, but I, I just wanted to conclude that before we open it up, because I think it could be, uh, it'd be beneficial to do it that way. Mr. Healy. If I may. Um, You've heard us bandy about Chapter 70 money, and uh, uh, I'm the chair of, uh, uh, the mayor appointed me the chair of the uh, Building Facilities uh, Usage Subcommittee, and uh, Ms. Joyce and, uh, and Ray sit on the committee with me. And uh, so we're charged with bringing that back to the, uh, to the committee of a whole after we, uh, after we vet out the process. Um, I would like to ask, uh, Ms. Joyce or Vice Chairman Acello to uh, briefly explain perhaps uh, the difference between Chapter 70 money versus the city site money. I don't think a lot of people really understand that. Uh, Chapter 70 money is called net school spending, meaning that it's money that comes from the state. Um, it's really close to 80% of our budget. Um, and it's monies that can be spent on basically teaching and learning, um, salary, personnel. Um, Non-net school spending comes from the city side and that pays, the bulk of that money goes to pay for our buses um, and crossing guards um, and some other equipment and a little bit of community school um, um, involvement. But uh, to run the schools, uh, pay the teachers, uh, it's 80% is really being paid by the state and it's called Chapter 70 net school spending. Non-net school spending is the city's contribution um, and that's, those are the items that the city basically pays for. Um, so we are, um, the, the towns, the, the, the smaller towns, it's basically flip-flopped. About 80%, 90% of their budgets they pay for and the state only gives them a small portion and that's basically um, because, unfortunately, in Brockton, um, we have a large percentage of um, the population that uh, just, you know, doesn't make a lot of money. That you know, we have a lot of kids that are um, low, come from low-income families, and um, um, that's just the way it is. It's the state formula that um, you know is fortunate that Brockton has this to supplement our school system. Um, 
So there are only certain things that we can spend the state's money on. Building uh, a new school or renovating the schools, that's a no-no. Um, basically the state says that's a capital improvement. If, you are do if, if we're maintaining the school, minor repairs, we can use our, our state money on that. But if you're talking about capital improvements, large expenses, that's, that's something that has to come from the city side. Um, and um, that's basically, in a nutshell, the difference. Um, um, we just really have one more topic for the school side. Oh, this is Joyce. Oh, considering that we're talking about the Howard School, um, I know a lot of people would envision that as a good fix because it's a, it's a large school. But the feasibility study came back <laughs> with an over four million dollar price tag to bring that school back online for us. And as a result, and as Tom had, had mentioned, we cannot use our school money for that. So the city would have been on the hook to pay that four million dollars. Just to put it in relation to a new school building, our new schools that we just put online, the Baker and the George School, they were maybe seven million dollars each as a price tag to the city for brand new schools. So it would cost almost as much as a new school to bring that older school online for us. So it just didn't make sense to us. We'd have to put it out to the to the voters, we'd have to put it out to the council, and it just wasn't in the cards for us. We just knew that it wouldn't be an option for us at this point. So that's why the, the Howard's offline. Uh, with respect to school initiatives, I'd like to invite Superintendent Smith. Um, Thank you, Mr. Minicello, and again, excuse my back to the City Council. Uh, I'm excited to be here this evening, and it would probably take me hours to really talk to you about the initiatives that are happening in the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, I've been superintendent for a little over six months, and, and it seems like it's much longer than that. It's been very, very exciting. Uh, I've been out in the community uh, starting back in September. I have met with community groups. I have met with Youth Voice. I have met with parents. I have met with administrators. We're presently just completing what I'm calling uh, a transition and an entry plan and during that time I looked at a number of things in the school systems I looked at organization and efficiency I looked at the budgeting process and the finances I've looked at the leadership we're looking at teaching and learning we're looking at the culture of the schools so as far as talking to you about the initiative some of the things that are coming through loud and clear many of you have heard about uh, the new educator evaluation system which is coming down from the Department of Elementary and secondary education. I've been in the system 37 years and the system that we used to evaluate teachers when I started back in 1977 was the system that we just vacated six or seven months ago. So it's been a very huge shift for us professionally in the school system and certainly across the state and across the country. So to tell you what's happening with that, we're actually looking at the professional practice of teachers. It's a much more thoughtful practice. It, it involves your administrators. It involves bringing your teachers to that next level to make sure that every teacher in front of your child is a quality teacher. The other things that we're looking at, you heard us talk about technology. Again, coming from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, of course, as an urban center, we're chosen to Field Test Park, which is a partnership assessment for readiness for college and career. And that goes along with our transitioning into what they call the Common Core Standards. We previously had had the Massachusetts frameworks. We are transitioning to Common Core. It's a different way to teach standards to our students in math, English language arts, science, eventually social studies, and all of our subjects. So that being said, when you talk about online testing, the technology is huge. We're picked to do a field testing come March through June. And we're looking at, thank goodness we're allowed to actually, they had us slated for 18 sites for this field testing to go on. We don't have that capability technology wise and we're not the only ones. This is happening across the state. So we're trying to infuse our school system with tablets. Eventually we will see the desktops go away and we want to probably close to 4,000 tablets in the next couple of years to make sure that your children, start, from the time they start with us in kindergarten, have opportunities 
to understand what it is to, to drop and drag and all of the other instructional things that we have to teach them when they come to us and need to understand about technology. Other things that are coming across as, as I look at this audience, I've heard this from community groups, I've heard this in, in our own uh, school system, we're looking at the diversity of our teaching staff. And, and it's very important to me, and, and I stand here and tell you that, as I said, I've been here 37 years, and one of the things, for, for a, a long time we went and we looked to recruit people to come to Brockton. And what we have found out is we are very rich with students that are advanced placement students. They're, they're students that like teaching in our city. They like our kids and they like the challenges. And those are our own students. So when I talk to you about a grow your own model, this is something I'm pursuing with businesses, with college partnerships, that we start to identify those students at a very early age when they're here at a West Middle School. Have them belong to a future teacher club. Support them when they go on to the high school. Make sure that we're, we are looking at students, thank you. But we're, we're looking at students that are interested in the sciences, they're interested in the maths. These are the kids that we want to bring back into our system. They not, not only become the high quality teachers, they also become your coaches. They get involved with your youth groups. Those are the kind of teachers that we want to have in the Brockton Public Schools. Um, you know, we're talking again about even looking, we, we have had, and, and when I look back, I have to, again, you understand I've been a resident a long time here. And I want to thank our city council for the work that they do. And even though I've been in the school system 37 years, I've had some late nights there. And when I say that, your school committee, they're there two, three nights, we're, we're negotiating. I, I am calling this the perfect storm. They're negotiating six contracts right now. We have settled, I think, two. You know, th there's a lot of work that goes on to make sure that this school system runs smoothly. I'll be very, very excited to come back to you at another time and to talk to you about my findings, the strategic plan, my entry plan, and what I promise you is that in every classroom, every teacher, every parent, every group will understand what is our vision of the Brockton Public Schools for now and the future. What is our mission in the Brockton Public Schools? What is the support of the school committee look like as we move forward and what is the support of the citizens? When you hear Mr. Minicello talk about a facility master plan, and yes I'm looking at a 20 year facility master plan. My children are grown. They went to the Brockton Public Schools. They had an excellent education. What is it going to look like 20 years from now? I vis visited school school systems where we love Brockton High School. You know, we're the city of champions. But 43, 4,500 schools for high school, that's not the way to go. You know, we need to look at 20 years down the road, are we looking at an 800 student body technology center, STEM initiative high school. Though That's the wave of the future and that's where you have to position your children. So I also will tell you, out there talking to parents, <clears throat> I have not turned down one invitation to speak. I've told parents, I met, uh, I'll never forget 150 parents at East Middle School talking, and I was talking with an interpreter, and you know how large our English language learner population is growing. Parents want to be part of the process. They want you to communicate with them. They want to understand what's happening in the schools. And I promise as your superintendent, I am looking at creating advocacy centers for our special needs parents, for our bilingual parents, growing a communications department so we can get that message out there, bringing in parent volunteers, which is something we haven't done in a long time in a meaningful way with training to support the initiatives going on in our schools. So I, I welcome any questions. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity. I hope to be out there in community. As I said, if there are community members out there, you know, please invite me. I'll be very pleased to speak about what's happening in the schools. Thank you, Superintendent. Question? Yeah, I think I think before we take the Q and A, as I said before, um, because you know we're cognizant of the time. I thank you, Superintendent. I want to have Southeastern Regional, uh, Mr. McAllister, Mr. Lindy, uh, give us an update on Southeastern Regional, and then we're going to open up to the floor. And if anybody has any questions for any of us up here, the Superintendent, Mr. Thomas, anybody, it's fair game, and that's really the purpose of tonight. So with that, Mr. Lindy, Mr. McAllister. First of all, thank you very much for including us. We sometimes feel like the forgotten part of government, um, <laughs> and it's nice to have everybody all in one room. I'm going to tell you a little story about a success. First of all, I am a proud graduate of Brockton Public Schools, and I don't think I would be where I am today without them. 
Uh, I hung out a little too much in the TV studio and ended up doing television. Over at Southeastern, within the last couple of years, we did a $33 million renovation, which was paid for by the Mass School Building Authority. There's a penny on the sales tax that goes towards school renovation. We also bonded for 25 years the other 20%. We did not go back to one of our nine communities to a town meeting or to the city council and ask for more money. We did it with the resources that we had. 62% um, of the students are from Brockton, and just to give you a little numbers as well, not, not as many, um, there are 1,351 total students at Southeastern, and 821 of them are from Brockton, so 62%, like Councilor Sullivan said. We've put in new programs like music, drama, TV production, things that the Brockton public schools have also done, but you wouldn't expect in a vocational school. We have a lot of the traditional programs, we're tweaking it a little bit. We also have a technical institute that is an evening program as well. Um, and we get people from in district and out of district. Um, and uh, Superintendent Smith was talking about tablets and technology. This year we were able to have all the sophomores at Southeastern have a tablet. It's actually a Chromebook. And we've just started to introduce them to freshmen. So instead of lugging the textbooks to school and becoming the hunchback of Notre Dame with how much they weigh, they're all in a Chromebook at this point in time. A lot of technology. Um, we've upgraded everything over there. Wayne's been around uh, double the time that I've been around. He's 11 years. I'm heading into my sixth year. But it's an absolute success story. We're very proud of it. We want to share the story. We want people to come every year. We do an open house in November. Uh, this year it was a big hoopla because we had the state treasurer who chaired the building authority. Uh, different officials were down there. It's just a great untapped resource and uh, um, I'm proud to be part of it. Yeah, um, well, I've been there, as Mark said, 11 years. But, um, you know, I, one of the things that motivated me to go over there was um, vocational education was not on anybody's radar screen. It was only academic. Uh, until they come to your house because your pipe broke or, you know, you need electric upkeep or uh, you need your, some, you know, air conditioning and heat break, then you realize the impact of what a vocational school teaches you. It teaches you to make a lot of money. And there are also individuals who are self-employed. I mean, there are small business people. And these are, mo these are motivated children because they, they in all es uh, essence, they understand what they want to be from the very beginning. <clears throat> and we provide the school that th they make those choices at. Um, so, we have now uh, an environmental program. We have a criminal justice program along with the, the programs that Mark had sp spoken about. We have blind admissions. Uh, and it, this is my own pet peeve here, but, and I'll share it with you. Sometimes I would look at the numbers and, and think that, well, everybody's sending us just their special ed kids. And everybody knows in schools understand how expensive special ed kids are. Uh, we do a fantastic job with special ed. And basically it's because it's a blind admissions program. And we have an awful lot of special ed children who do extremely well in our setting. Uh, so that's just my little pet peeve uh, that I have about that. But um, uh, we are, uh, we have on, on total, I think the other night's meeting was 350 applicants who are waiting to get into the school. So uh, if you know anyone that wants a vocational school to go to Southeast and Regional, uh, call Mark and, and I and we do the best we can to try to get you in there. You have to go through the process naturally, but we most certainly uh, uh, will speak, speak for those children that uh, should be spoken for, uh, especially those that really truly want to be in the vocational setting. Um, with that, I guess we're ready for questions. Yeah, wanna, just, uh, just one on quick question. Um, in terms of calling us, if you turn on channel 12, all the phone numbers of all the elected officials that are in this room, at this table, are on there. They're on the BCA website. I know they're going to probably be all on the city website with the newly revamped website, so you know how to get in touch with us. I have a listed public phone number, so uh, as most of us do. So uh, thank you all for being patient and listening to all of us. And yeah, I want to thank both uh, Mr. Lindy and Mr. McAllister. I mean, Southeastern Regional is a great, great institution. It serves the city and the students that attend there well.
Um, if I could, right before we start the Q&A, if you don't mind, I think this is uh, extremely important. Um, those that are in attendance tonight, if you live in Ward 1, raise your hand. If you live in Ward 2, raise your hand. Ward 3. Ward 4. That was great. Ward 5. Ward 6. Ward 7. That's great. I mean, again, this is uh, this is one of four meetings we're going to have. We are going to go around the city, but this is really based upon the weather tonight. This is great. I mean, look at the turnout of the local officials that are here tonight too. So. Um, the way I think we should handle this tonight is if anybody has a question uh, for anything that was discussed tonight or anything that, that you want to uh, inquire about or be educated or, or criticized on, please come up to the mic if you could. <laughs> Good evening, sir. This way? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, address uh, Governor of Boston. My name is Richard. I'm, I'm part of the uh, Haitian community, and I work in downtown. And uh, the big project that's going on by the train, that's where we are. We are the uh, unemployment office. And uh, the, my question is, uh, when, you, when you work downtown, you can see the city living at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. And I wonder, and also, I don't think we have a residency, uh, rigid residency for elected officials, people working for the city. And I wonder if uh, the this, this city council can look into city tax, because a lot of people work in, the to in town, and they all live. And at night, there's nothing going on in the city. So I don't know if that is something the city or the mayor's office is looking into. Yeah, I, I, I think I understood the, the inquiry that, that relative to when close of business happens, when, when people leave for the day, they're, they're vacating the downtown area, right? I mean, and that's, I think unfortunately, that's, that's reality. It's not uh, downtown Brockton in the 40s or 50s or 60s. Uh, you know, some of the uh, more uh, senior people in, in, the, in the city say that when the Westgate Mall was built, you saw a, a big flight from, from the downtown area, but I do think uh, this mayor, this city council, the school committee, I mean, we're, we're working uh, to try to bring about some, some positive change down there. The Trinity Financial and the mayor can touch upon that, but the city council's approved uh, some endeavors on that. It's a $30 million investment downtown. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman from Cambridge that came to Brockton, Jason Corp is his name, and he bought the old Stalin Dean building on Montello Street. He renovated, he spent a ton of money on that, and it, it, it's, it's beautiful, you know? Um, so we have 40 hour smart growth zoning. We're a gateway city uh, recognized by the state. You know, we have the benefit of the city of Brockton, other than the local officials here, we, we are unique in the sense that we have three state reps that serve the city of Brockton. We have one senator. So we do have some, uh, some people speaking on Beacon Hill for us as well. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I, and I, I can speak for everybody here. We, of course, we want it to flourish downtown. We don't want the, the flight at 4.30, 5 o'clock. You know, there's businesses down there that are trying to do it. Uh, Tambu. Uh, Chris Charlotte down there, he spent a million bucks to renovate, you know, that restaurant. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm cognizant of that, and I know my colleagues are, and if anybody uh, that serves that area, Mr. Monaghan, Mr. DiNapoli, want to talk about it, of course, the mayor. That's right. I, I, I think they gave me a mic. Here we go. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I, I think you kind of hit on a couple of different topics there. Um, you know, as I come in as the new mayor, I, I think this city faces two major challenges, and they're tied together. One is reducing crime and making the city safe and changing the perception of the city so that people perceive that the city is safe, and economic development, which most people refer to as jobs, but I think jobs doesn't really explain what we need to do, because jobs are created when businesses expand, when businesses come here to locate. So I, I think that we have to look at the bigger picture of creating a climate of attractions so that businesses want to invest in the city of Brockton. And when business owners and developers make a decision to begin investing in Brockton again, the jobs will come with them. Um, on the immediate forefront, um, you mentioned the Trinity Project. Uh, my office is working closely with them right now, organizing a job fair for next month because one of the things I've lobbied very hard with them, I'm disappointed that it's not a completely a union project. It's partially a union project. Um, but having said that, 
Uh, I've asked them to make a commitment to Brockton residents getting first crack at any available jobs down there. And they're working with us on that. We'll be having a job fair in March for Brockton residents to be able to apply for jobs on that construction project. And I think also I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Representative Cronin and Representative Brady are both here. And as we're working on the, uh, w what is the best plan for redeveloping the downtown, um, it's not a new idea, but there's no doubt in my mind that getting a satellite college campus downtown will be the linchpin to redeveloping the downtown. And Representatives Cronin and Brady are working very closely with us to put that together. Um, I have a meeting with DCAM coming up next week, and uh, we're looking at bringing two or three state colleges and universities together in a complex in downtown Brockton. It's not easy to put together, um, but I believe we're going to make that happen this year, and if we do make that happen, I really believe that would be a catalyst to bringing back the downtown, along with Vicente's and other good projects also. And can I just add to that too, if that's if that's okay? Um, I mean, there. There's a lot of talk about who the job creators are, but the reality is that consumers create the jobs. In other words, if there's demand, if there are individuals with disposable income, they create demand and then businesses try to supply that demand. And so I think what the mayor just mentioned is, is key to the puzzle. Um, bringing in businesses, um, whether they service individuals in the city or outside the city, but they're in a growth market and being able to identify who those businesses are, uh, what industries are in, and aggressively pursuing those businesses. And then secondly, bringing in individuals into the downtown area and to, into the city in general, but you mentioned downtown, who have disposable income. Um, and so I think part of that dynamic includes the idea of bringing a college university down with young people who like to spend money, uh, as well as the Trinity Financial Project and others that are attracting uh, market rate uh, payers who have disposable income. And when those folks are there, you will start to see, I believe, more commercial demand. And some of this happens at the same time. So you have projects that will be housing lots of individuals who we hope have disposable income. And at the moment, there's a deficit in places they can go and shop, and we, and we know that um, Vicente's and others will meet that demand. So I think that really speaks to the larger issue of where we're going in terms of city planning. Um, as the mayor mentioned, we've, the city council has approved this new planning department. I think the city has, there's been a total dearth of planning for decades in the city, which is in part why we uh, suffer economically. And so I know that's a principal focus of the new mayor. Uh, so I, I do believe that sort of the hodgepodge of activity that's happening that may not be connected to a strategy will help. And then putting a strategy in place to fill the gaps. Uh, will be instrumental, and I, I foresee that this being the focus of the mayor, that you know we're going to see some real quick traction on this, and and so the change, that sea change that you're looking for in terms of people, you know, exiting the city to spend their money elsewhere, we'll start to see some changes in that. I think. From the school side, uh, we recognize that how the schools are perceived is certainly um, a benefit to the image of the city. So we're very cognizant of that fact and all of us on the school committee as well as you know the counselors and the mayor and administration um, take pride and are very uh, cautious when it comes to our kids and making sure that our, our schools are up to snuff uh, both facility wise and certainly academically and, and I think you've seen that um, but you know with all of the the balls up in the air with regard to economic development and crime I mean the goal is to retain families attract families um, and part of that you know in the city I think tied into economic development is the condition of our fields and parks and you know we need to pay attention to that as well um, because some of them need TLC. You, you go into some of the other towns and their parks are pristine. You go into the city of Boston, their baseball fields look fantastic. Um, so all of, all, all of these balls up in the air are, are factors that uh, contribute to the image of the city and retention. Retention of good solid families, good solid people. So. 
um, you know, we're all trying to work together to, to accomplish that. Um, but, um, you know, it all costs money. And um, you know the the money is there's only so much of it. So um, I, I think economic development, attracting people to this city, and showing them what we have to offer is a way to to increase revenues, and, and that way we can invest in the so infrastructure, so to speak, of our city. Yeah, I mean that was a great question, and I think at the end of the day, everybody up here and everybody that's here, because um, you wouldn't have come here if you didn't care about Brockton. And one of the other things that we're fortunate enough. Uh, as elected officials is we have good partners. We have the Montello, Campello Business Association, Downtown Business Association. Of course, we've got the Chamber. Um, so we, we do have a, a vested group of people that really care, um, and hopefully we can continue to grow that. Council Dubois, I think you had something, and Mr. Lindy as well. I do. If, if, I, if I heard you correctly, you had talked a little, I thought you said something about residency, yeah. and you yeah. talked yeah. about construction in yeah. the city? Um, yeah, because when you, when you look at the uh, fire department, they have to leave the city for seven years, and then after that, they can move away. And they are not here, they just work here. And I think most of the problem we have in the city is because people work in Boston, and they live somewhere else. And I know we can't do what Boston is doing, requiring within for everybody, but how can we make, it, make people who are making money well, I think first off, I think that we could do that. It would take some time and some effort and some political will to do that. Um, but that is possible to reinstate a more severe form of residency requirements like they have, like Ray Flynn, I just heard him on the radio today talking about the importance of doing that in Boston and really supporting that. But there has to be the political will there to do it. And right now there's a resolution before the city council that potentially speaks to doing away with residency entirely, which I don't agree with. I think that the seven years at least gives people time to settle into their homes and have children and see the beauty of the city like you and I have and then potentially choose to stay here because they want to stay. There are quite a few. But then that's on the books. And just so you know, the city also has an ordinance that weighs um, local um, bids f from local construction companies but with more weight than um, construction companies that come from outside of the city. So there is an ordinance that does give a little preference to local um, local bidders. Just wanted to tell you that. Uh, Mr. Lindy. Just a quick uh, thought. Um, having been the past chairman of the Downtown Brockton Association, which Councilor Sullivan mentioned, um, to hear the mayor talk about the whole Main Street program, and he was talking when I, when during the campaign we went around and covered things, extending that all the way from Campello to downtown over to Montello. Main Street's in, uh, you know, a, a corridor that needs a lot of improvement. So to hear that, if you look at the Boston model and what Tom and Nino did, is a whole bunch of Main Street programs that did nothing but reinvigorate the city of Boston. Took a 20 year period, it doesn't happen overnight, but you, you have the, the elements in place and with the new planning department, I can recall back years ago, my dad was on the planning board. At one point, the planning department for the city of Brockton in 1982 had 10 people in it. That was a long, long time ago, and they had a project called Mainbrook Redevelopment. The only building that got built under it was the Continental Cable Vision building back in the day, and then the planning department got tossed away because of economic tough times. So I think it's, we're in the rebuilding process to see all that happen. Um, downtown, um, you know, everybody told us at one point we were crazy for locating in the downtown, but we took a dead building at Brockton Community Access and brought it back. Irving's Hardware did, Irving's Center, uh, the Times Building, and look at what's going on with Trinity. It's just phenomenal. So I, I think it's going to happen. It just takes way more time than we, you know, we have. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Council Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank that gentleman for uh, bringing his question uh, before us because I think he's opened up the uh, dialogue to uh, a lot of different uh, concerns. I think that we all have um, as elected officials and, and even as residents. And as um, as I sit here and I even listen uh, to and have been uh, working for the last uh, several years, as as my other colleagues here in the city council have been trying to do, and, and uh, is definitely work with with some way of bringing you know economic development into the city um, to try to bring in new business. Um, I think that's something that I think we've all tried to do. I was successful. 
um, at one point working with the past administration and members of this uh, city council as when we brought in uh, the Bernardi Auto Group. Uh, it was a piece of desolate property up on uh, Manly Street um, that definitely had to be, um, had to go away and had something had to be constructed there and we were able to do that. They were, they were given a TIF um, and, and it, it worked out just fine that we were able to, you know, develop that piece of property. But something like that, it didn't happen overnight. Um, I, I think one thing that does get left out an awful lot and we talk about again business uh, public safety we need to we need to be doing some things there which we're trying to do um, which ties into economic development but we also forget I think one major thing our roadways our streets and I say as a city councilor our streets in the city of Brockton are in deplorable condition they really really are and we should be ashamed of that because we never do anything about it when I first came on the council I think second or third year in, we heard uh, a program that came through the DPW Commissioner's Office and how we were going to start to uh, put money away, put, it, put money away in a bank so that we could do some other works, you know, for our roadways. Um, that, that never really, as far as I can ever see or have, have ever seen, that, you know, that ever really came to any type of intuition to, to what we were doing in, in trying to make that work. You know, we received Chapter 90 monies from the state. That Chapter 90 monies comes in, um, and I think when I first came on, on the council, and council so Denapoli would know he was there before I. I think we were getting three to four million dollars back then. And now that's down to, if we're lucky, we get 1.5. They'll tell us, the governor will tell you, and the state people will tell you, oh, you're getting 2.7 million next year, and next thing you go, well, you got 1.5. Not enough to do a sidewalk. I mean, and it's, and it's not the right thing to do and to have in an urban city. And I know as a, as a city councilor and a ward councilor, you know, it's the greatest concern that I hear all the time. Yes, I hear about public safety. Yes, I hear about businesses. We need to do these different things. We need to take care of other, other things. But, but the major thing that people come to me is, when am I going to get a new street? I'm a taxpayer, and I never get a new street. I've tried in my area to be successful, successful to get as many new streets. There's a certain percentage of streets we have out there, believe it or not, after how old the city of Brockton is, there's still unaccepted streets. And it costs money to have that street accepted. And then you hope and pray that maybe you might be able to have it resurfaced for those people. <coughs> it, it doesn't go away. It, it really doesn't. But we need to, as a city council, and, he, and I'll even point it back to the mayor, and I'm not being rude to do that, mayor, but we need to all work together to try to find a way that when we do all these other things and we talk the good game, we need to take care of our streets, our roadways, whether they be secondary, neighborhood streets, major. Those things need to go coincide to what we're trying to do. That also bring business here to the city as well. So I just make that point. I, I think it's very, very important, and, and, uh, and I think you know the taxpayer wants to see that at some point. A new street always makes somebody smile. Thank you. Uh, council made a good point. If anybody lives on a private way in the city of Brockton and you'd like to uh, contemplate having it accepted by the city of Brockton, and Council Cruz did this in Ward 1 on Windsor Circle off of Rockland Street, uh, everybody that lived on that street signed a petition, and then that started the process. So if anybody is contemplating that, you need to reach out to your ward council, and there is a procedure in place. Um, anybody else have any, would like to come forward and ask Mr. Curtis? Followed by you, gentlemen. You, you, you have to, Mr. Curtis. Thank you, Councillor. First of all, on behalf of all of us in this room, it's not, it's very unlikely that you guys have a moment of say thank you from us as the residents for the city for stepping forward and giving us your time and your talents to help run this city. I, so thank you very much for thank what you. you've done. Thank you. I have a couple of comments. As it relates to the school committee, as it relates to the work of Superintendent Smith and her leadership team and uh, our representatives from Southeast Regional, whatever you've been doing, full steam ahead because it is working. It is working. Keep up the good job for what we do for the kids in this city because it's only going to get better as we go forward. As I look at the mayor, I look at the city council, we looked at the election that we had in November. It was an exciting moment for our city. It brought out a wide range of voters who usually would not come out in an uh, election year that didn't have a presidential election or a governor's race running. And that, race result and that election resulted in 
two additional members of our minority community in being elected into vacant seats, as well as a new Ward 7 counselor over here in the other vacant seat. Congratulations. Behind me are additional members of residents of the city who also ran as part of that election, and they need to be thanked for stepping forward and recognizing what they could do for the city as well. My message to the mayor's office, my message to the city council is, is that you know what needs to be done in our city. We, you all are going to do a tremendous job. You wouldn't be sitting there if your heart wasn't in it. And all that I ask for and what I've seen with the, with the new uh, administration on board and the new council members on board as well is that there's transparency in the process as we go forward. And when that transparency comes to a vote, all that I ask is that as a councilor at large, you will vote for the best interest of the city. If you are a ward councilor, please put, a, put aside any biases that you may carry personally, professionally, in regards to the, any issues that you're looking at, and make sure that the vote that you cast is ultimately in the best interest of the city, even though I know we, re we hired you or we elected you as a ward counselor, but you all, your vote also carries an awful lot of weight for this city, and it's important that you remember that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. that we've had in many, many years to come. And with that, there are many, many funds that are going to come to Brockton. The language that was put in the House bill, which we just passed, uh, puts an April 1st deadline on the funds. So that means that the construction projects can begin during construction season. Uh, there was another project that was approved in our supplement, in our transportation bill last week. And Representative Mike Brady was very instrumental in that. And that was $5 million of funding was granted uh, to go towards making Main Street two ways back again, extends to the Warren Avenue. This all has occurred in the last six weeks. Uh, so I feel confident that these funds are going to come. And uh, there was not a lot printed about it in the paper, but those funds have been approved. So We do have a reporter here tonight, so thank you. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Good evening. Hello, everybody. Um, I come today as a, as, a, as a teacher. I work at Independence Academy, which is one of four recovery high schools in Massachusetts, so I'm really proud of that. Um, I'm also a parent of a student who uh, goes to this school. I see some of his teachers uh, here, um, or at least one of the teachers, and, uh, and a concerned citizen. And, and I, too, want to thank you elected officials for uh, having this forum. It, it says a lot about your dedication, your commitment. Superintendent is here. We have the mayor, city council, um, and the school committee. Um, my, my question is around given my work as a as a drug and alcohol counselor as a as a teacher as a tobacco treatment specialist um, to the folks uh, in front of me is uh, what is Brockton doing around uh, tobacco prevention I know that CVS we may know that CVS went um, decided to, to go tobacco free and I'm wondering if any other pharmacies or other uh, institutions are following suit or if there's push for that kind of legislation uh, and um, the other question I had had to do with uh, drug and alcohol. We have an epidemic in, in the city regarding drugs um, and uh, what is being done around that, especially in our schools too, as far as prevention and education. Uh, those are great, great questions. And you know, unfortunately, the crime that occurs, not just in Brockton, but, but nationwide in the Commonwealth, is, is, they're all connected to drugs and drug abuse, unfortunately, that's reality. But one thing that the city council did, and it was under um, Chief uh, Bill Conlon, is under the Massachusetts General Laws and Drug Paraphernalia Law, we brought forward a resolve, a resolution, because rolling papers fall under drug paraphernalia, and there are establishments here in the city of Brockton that sell rolling papers. I don't know too many people that roll tobacco anymore. It's obviously used for marijuana and other drugs, so um, it, 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 it was uh, mirrored after um, the, the chief in Hanover. 
um, and and you know when when you know when the mayor gets settled and the, and the chief gets settled, we can address that again because um, you know it's the kids that are buying the rolling papers that are using it for uh, illicit drugs. But also the thing that I find, and, and I know during the election, um, and it was stated by many people here, sir, it's not necessarily the illegal drugs; it's the legal drugs. It's the Percocets, it's the Oxys, uh, you know, and that leads to heroin abuse. So you know, we we as a, as a as a a body and I'll call this all as a, a, a conclusive body need to work with, with law enforcement. And I know, um, you know Mr. Curtis, one of the gentlemen that spoke today, I mean, he has a great cable show um, about that. So um, thank you for bringing that up. If anybody wants to address it, I know it's an ongoing problem and it's an epidemic and we need to try to at least, uh, we're not gonna cure it, but we need to at least uh, combat it. Andy. I know, and I don't want to steal any of the mayor's thunder, but I know there's, <laughs> there's two grants in the city now. Um, and as a professional, I have the opportunity to work on grants like this in, in cities across the southeast. I work with Fall River and New Bedford and Quincy and, and communities in Boston. But there's two um, substance abuse prevention grants in the city now. Well, actually three. Two are housed in the mayor's office. One that works on opioid overdose prevention um, and one that works on prescription drug prevention. Um, there's also another grant that works on underage drinking prevention that's housed at Health Imperatives, which is a, 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 a public health agency um, down on West Chestnut. Um, you know, we have the Recovery High, which is a great resource for, for our young people who are struggling with addiction. We got folks in this room, citizens, uh, you know, Larry Curtis has his show on cable access, which is an amazing resource. I've had the opportunity to, to be a part of that, and, and I think others in this room have. Um, his wife as well, not just Larry. Yeah, we give her a shout Larry. out too. Well, Larry and the whole team of folks, sorry. Um, really, Larry and the whole team of folks who, who continue to put this issue and, and hold it forward. They've had... Um, they've hosted events at some local churches and, and engaged a, a pretty broad community. Um, so there are things happening in the city beyond you know, law enforcement and, and, and the, the efforts of, of local citizens, um, really good things, things that are evidence-based, things that are funded by the federal government and the state um, Department of Public Health and the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, which programs within the schools um, to support that. And we we're, I actually had conversations today about how we can kind of bring some of those things to the forefront and how they play into the um, ability of our kids to learn and excel um, and, and they're just as important as some of the educational initiatives that, that we do. So thanks for bringing that forward. Um, I, that's just what I know. The issue certainly was brought forward to the school committee uh, a few years back. I mean, it was uh, the, the abuse of, you know, obviously of drug and alcohol by some of our youth, we realized was a problem that, you know, crossed all lines. And it was a little secret that people really didn't want to address in the city and in the schools. Um, unfortunately, um, my friend to my left here had a lot of experience with it and really brought it to the forefront uh, with the school administration. So um, the recovery high school that we now invest in, and all of us in the school committee at the time, um, you know, felt that it was a good cause. Now, if you read the blogs and the papers, uh, there were a lot of bomb tossers who basically were like, you know, uh, why are you spending money towards this? This is this is BS. This isn't what education is supposed to be about. Well, you know, there were lots of good kids that got sucked into um, in, into drug and alcoholism, and and it doesn't matter if you're from a good family, a poor family, a rich family. It crosses all lines. Um, and and to be honest with you, the guy that really spearheaded it is sitting to my left, and, and that's that's Bill. So I won't belabor that point other than to say obviously I, I think we're making a lot of progress and there's been a lot of initiatives in the city over the last few years. Um, if I could just respond to a couple of things real quickly, um, I would also like to thank Representative Brady for his work on two-way two -way street funding. My office worked very closely with Mike in getting that in as a late file and, and uh, we're very appreciative of the representative's efforts. Um, on the drug issue, um, Councilor Sullivan referenced, you know, items that are being sold in the convenience stores. The biggest threat in the convenience stores right now is synthetic drugs that aren't regulated by uh, current existing drug statutes, and they're extremely dangerous, extremely addictive, and they can be fatal. And I actually met with the district attorney a couple weeks ago to craft a strategy as to how to get those out of the convenience stores in Brockton. And uh, we're actually looking at an ordinance that was passed in Middleborough recently, and I, I plan to bring something along 
the same lines forward to the Ordinance Committee and the City Council for consideration that would give at least the local police the ability to get those synthetic drugs out of convenience stores. Um, also, I'm partnering with BIC and lobbying very hard to get a drug court established in the Brockton District Court. Drug courts work. Uh, the Quincy has one, South Boston has one, and right now there is some state money becoming available to establish five new drug courts across the state, and uh, we're lobbying very hard to try to get some of that funding for a drug court in Brockton um, because people that are nonviolent and addicted to drugs should be, should be put in treatment, not in jail, and that's how we fix the problem. Um, and lastly, thank you. Lastly, just to make you aware, we are in the midst of an, of an overdose crisis right now in, in southeastern Mass and in Brockton. The last time I checked yesterday, Brockton had had, I believe, 15 overdoses in the past week, and I think at least three of them fatal. Um, and so there is a drug available called Narcan that can be administered to save overdose victims. And it's a miracle drug. I've seen it myself. Someone that's near death can be brought back within a couple minutes with a, a nasal inhaler that looks just like uh, something you would use for asthma. And it's been distributed on a pilot basis. Uh, but I'll, I'll use this as a form to announce tonight that uh, at my direction, within two weeks, the Brockton Fire Department will be carrying Narcan. And uh, that will save lives. So the, um, the, uh, the Narcan training is, uh, we've been approved by DPH. All the firefighters have to be trained in, in administering it. It's going to take about two weeks to get everyone trained. Over 90% of our firefighters are EMTs. They're the first ones to respond to medical calls. They're usually there anywhere from five to eight minutes before the ambulance gets there that has the Narcan. We have highly qualified people that are already there first. It's crazy to let someone die waiting for the ambulance. So we're going to start administering Narcan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Was there anybody else on, on the panel that wanted to, to address that issue? Mr. Healy. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, what, what are uh, synthetic drugs? I thought it was pretty hip, but I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> There's a whole variety of them, but you know, they, they tend to mimic more stuff like crystal meth and things like that. But there's a whole variety of them, and because they can just keep changing the formula a little bit, they're, they're a moving target and trying to classify them under existing drug laws. Well, what um, are they used for? Are they over the counter? Well, different convenience stores sell them differently. Uh, some sell them somewhat in the open, others keep them out of sight, but then have them available for customers that ask when they come in. It's not illegal right now. It's not illegal. There's nothing on the books. And it, it can take a couple years to pass uh, you know, a new drug law, and in the meantime, they've changed the formula to something else. But um, working with the Plymouth County DA, Middleborough has done a local ordinance recently that would allow the local police to get the stuff out of the stores. And we actually, we have the solicitor's office looking at the Middleborough ordinance right now to see if maybe um, tweaking it a little, vetting it out a little bit more, and then bringing it forward to the council for consideration. Thank you. Yeah. Entertain another question. That's Please come forward if you have a question. Good evening, ma'am. Hi. Um, actually, following up on the the um, streets and, and the uh, conditions of the streets, the um, trash that's everywhere. We have uh, people from Mainspring cleaning up downtown, but we're saying the parks could use cleaning. I think maybe if the, the Mainspring people cleaned the parks and handed out citations to property owners. I mean, property owners should be responsible for cleaning their own properties. Biggest eyesore, gateway to the city, on the way to the Rock Rocky Marciano Stadium is that fairgrounds. When the snow melts, the anchor fence is full of trash stuck in it, and it looks that way until the fair opens, fair closes, and it's back to the trash everywhere. And one of the biggest property owners in the city ought to be held accountable. You know, Tuesday night, Monday's the holiday, of course, but Tuesday night uh, we have a, a meeting of the Finance Committee, and uh, I, I filed an order uh, that was going to be heard on Tuesday. It's Chapter 40U under Massachusetts General Law. 40U is, is and hopefully it passes, it's going to give teeth 
uh, and, and the mayor would know this, for, for code enforcement, uh, for border health, for nuisance issues, uh, for blight. And what it does is uh, the, the fine will actually be attached to the property. So it's just a lien at the Registry of Deeds that can sit there until someone refinances or someone dies and the family pays it. This is going to be a municipal lien that will show up in the MLC. And if it's not paid, it can eventually be a tax taking, believe it or not. It's something that Mayor Menino pushed for in the city of Boston. And it's something that he brought forward that's going to be vetted out. But it's just another tool in the toolbox. And, and I know that everybody that sits up here, I mean, we live here. We're raising our kids here, our family here. We, we see the blight. So um, we, we're trying. Yeah, and, and you know, believe it or not, this is something that Councilor Sullivan and I agree upon, so. <laughs> you heard that, right? You heard that. <laughs> We're meeting tomorrow on Valentine's Day at lunchtime, you know. Bill, Bill's bringing the chocolates, I'm bringing the flowers. That's right. I thought it was the other one. No, I, thought you were buying, ah, you know. I thought he was buying me lunch tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but seriously, this, this is a real significant issue in the city, and particularly as the, as, as the lady mentioned, um, when, when we have issues on main streets, gateways, in and out of the city, because then people who don't live in the city form their impression of what Brockton's like based upon seeing something as they drive through. and. Uh, we have several initiatives going, and I, I support the, this and have lobbied for the same thing that Councillor Sullivan is doing by being able to lean the civil fines. It'll make us more effective. Um, I'm also bringing forward to the Council in the near future a request for a modification to the nuisance ordinance to specify failure to remove graffiti as a violation of the city's nuisance ordinance, and we're going to couple that with a program to help property owners pay for the cost of the removing the graffiti because the property owner is much more the victim than the person responsible for it. However, it has to get removed and it has to get removed every time it comes up. And if they put it up four times, you take it down four times. They tag you fifth time, you take it down again. It's the only way we'll ever get the graffiti um, out of the city. Uh, I'm also have a meeting coming up in the near future with the Attorney General's office and we are uh, lobbying and hoping to get some funding from the Attorney General, not out of the city budget, to fund a second outside code enforcement officer that would be signed uh, strict, uh, directly to vacant and abandoned properties, which are also a big issue in our neighborhoods in the city. And by having that and coupling that, uh, that person's efforts with the additional ability to, um, to lean the fines along with the vacant abandoned property ordinance that this council passed a couple years ago that's a damn good ordinance and uh, by putting those things together we can start holding particularly out of city banks that own a lot of these properties and, and ignore them and allow them to become blights in our neighborhoods uh, to, to maintain them reasonably and minimize the damage until they're resold to someone else so I, I look forward this year to working very closely with the council uh, on a number of initiatives around code enforcement to improve the quality of life in the neighborhoods. <coughs> Mr. Monaghan. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, just, in a, just following up on that, um, if, if you see in your neighborhood, vacant home, or even your neighbor's home, the trash all over the place, uh, lawns, not necessarily your neighbors, but if they're vacant, uh, lawns overgrown, what have you, it's an eyesore in the neighborhood, that all you have to do is call the Board of Health. There is the funds to go to that home, if it's a vacant home, but, uh, mow the lawn, clean it up, make it look good, neaten it up for the neighborhood so it doesn't look like an eyesore. And you can take advantage of that. And, and I've, my, I've had people call me on it, but just riding around my ward, you see those homes. I used to call uh, Mayor Carpenter because that's what he did. I was on the phone to him once a week or more, harassing him. And he would actually go to have the uh, Board of Health take care of it, and they would put a lien on that property. And also, like I said, even if your neighbor's homes or whatever, you see someone that's really being is an eyesore, you can also call the, call the board out too. Is the property on East Street, oh, if you, oh, you can address it, but on East Street with the high tension wires, are people like double truckloads of stuff there to sit for weeks? Is, uh, you know, the electric company responsible for that or is the city responsible? No, we pick it up. We pick it up because you call the number down at the uh, trash uh, people, Brad Brennan's outfit. And they go over the pickup truck and they'll try to identify. The trash collector? They'll try to identify the owner of that trash. And they will, in fact, they will, in fact, write into the citation. Some cameras here would be good. Anybody else on the panel? Um, 
Sir, before we get to you, the, the, the woman behind you, ma'am, I know you've been very patient with your hand. Well, I'll let you come forward if you could, because I know you've been very patient sitting over there raising your hand. Okay, well. Good evening. Good evening, I'll try to be brief. I don't know where to turn my back, but um, my name is Gwen Barnes, and I'm a proud resident of, of Brockton. I may be predating myself, but I'll do it anyway, because I, I started at the uh, Sprague School, if any of you remember, you probably don't. Sprague School, George S. Payne Junior High School, and the Brockton High School. And I graduated from the old Brockton High School on uh, with, at Eldon uh, B. Keith Field. But I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the uh, council. I'm learning so much through my daughter, Shana Barnes, and I'm so proud of her. She, she's gonna get me, she's gonna get me on the way home because we have to ride together in my car, so, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She'll walk, it's my car. <laughs> oh yeah, um, but I, I just, I just, I just want to thank you all. I, I, I've been meeting so many new interesting people and I'm learning things at my ripe old age of <clears throat> and through my daughter and what the uh, city council really does. So that that's a new thing for me and I'm always learning. I always want to learn, or ever learning, ever changing. Um, also, I, I the other uh, issue that I have, I don't want to beat a dead horse to death, but I, I guess I will. I live two blocks down. I just found out tonight for my daughter that I live in Ward 1. I, I keep forgetting that or I never knew it, but at any rate, um, I live on uh, Winifred Road. So going down West Elm Street, it's like a whole lot of sinkhole wannabes. The road is really bad. And I wanted to know how you determine which uh, roads or streets get first priority. And I understand also that the young lady here did say you had, you had a, 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 huh? You had a deadline for finances on April when the construction starts after that. So uh, maybe that's two questions in one, but the first one is how do you determine which streets get the... Um, Actually, I mentioned earlier tonight, you must not have been paying attention. You might be like my kids. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably. Spring, I, I'm predating myself, I said. West Elm Street is actually going out to bid. The state is rebuilding the entire street. When? Going out in the spring. They tell me the spring, which should be the middle of March. Okay. Now, it was supposed to go out last spring, too, but they pushed it off to this fiscal year. Okay. And, in fact, the street is going to... And I mentioned at the beginning... Yeah, I did hear that. I just didn't know if there were other streets. Street in the city. I did uh, hear you say that, but I didn't know if other streets were in contention for well, West that, Elm Street. That, that's a state project that has been identified, been out through, okay. gone through all the planning. There are actually traffic lights okay, being added at Arlington Street. I did and hear that. I believe Ash Street. And uh, the sidewalk will be Street. redone to total rebuild, yep. which is unusual, oftentimes out of the Chapter 90 money, mm -hmm. which Councilor Ian Erie mentioned. It's, uh, uh, we get less than we did 20 years ago, and of course, today's dollar doesn't I, go as I, far I as... I heard all of that. Dollar. I just didn't know the priority uh, of the streets. And as far as other streets go, in fact, I received a letter in the mail today each councilor works with the uh, mayor's office generally, okay. who makes the final decision, but in the past has always okay. worked. And I know Mr. Kaplan will be working closely with us to identify the streets. And I will tell you, I agree with Councilor Ranieri, it's probably the most difficult is. decision we make because the streets in the city, uh, Mr. Thomas mentioned that it's about, I think he said 15 million just to do the yeah. parking lot at the I, high school. I believe it. We had I believe a, it. a project done about five years ago where the DPW commissioner came to us and to bring all the streets in the city up to acceptable limits, it was almost a price tag of close to a billion dollars. Ooh, wow, okay. Now, obviously not gonna happen. We do, the state has, our representatives have worked hard with us to uh, to try to up that money. I get frustrated because in fact, the largest transportation bond bill ever to go through the mm -hmm. state went through about a year ago. The governor has seen fit to put billions of that towards extending the rail line down to Fall River and New Bedford, which I happen to think I, it would be better bang for our buck to give us that money to, to fix our streets, but mm. that's the governor's decision, not ours. But uh, So as far as West Elm Street goes out to bid in, in the spring, which Excellent. even though it didn't seem it today, is actually pretty close to, mm -hmm. to being here. So okay. uh, uh, that should be out to bid soon, and then uh, it w the work won't, won't all be finished this year because okay. there is a lot of work to it. But uh, And then other streets, again, we'll be working with them. Each council, ward councilor, works with the mayor's office to identify the streets. And okay. You try to pick some, you know, you try to work with the streets that are really in bad shape, that are sometimes more, uh, uh, tr more well traveled by yes. by everybody in the city. But yes. also, when you live on a small, quiet road too, doesn't mean you don't have the right to get your roads. Uh, I understand. Done. That, so that was a, my concern about the It's a very difficult uh, decision. Yeah. I wanted to do Winifred Road now, but she said no. <laughs> yeah, Winifred Road could stand a few nip and tucks too. Four streets. 
down there were done not too long ago, although the gas company has done some major yeah. work, and we'll ask Mr. Monahan when they're going to fix some of that stuff. But okay. that's a different that's a different meeting. Okay, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. And uh, I also just want to say we're being joined right now by our state senator Tom Kennedy. Senator, thank you for being here. <laughs> Sir, if, if you had a, a question for the panel, uh, please come forward. Feel free to come forward. Thank you. Good evening. Mr. McAllister, thank you. And uh, we will, we're going to have another one of these. We'll, we'll talk about it. It's probably going to be in May, Wayne, but we'll be in touch. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Pat Moynihan. I also went to the Sprague, Payne, and Brockton High School. Um, I have three things, a comment, a question, and an, uh, a suggestion. And first, uh, housekeeping comment. This is the second time I've gone in bad weather, and the crutch in one leg is not the issue. I'm a ski pro. I've been on all kinds of bad terrain winter-wise. In fact, I'd love to be home watching Olympians. I've coached one, had four girls on the U.S. ski team. And unfortunately, I never skied till I was 23, or maybe I would have had that shot. The issue is um, the condition of... Um, the walkways coming in here, I had to go to four doors. I'm 75 and I'm in school. And I left early to come to the meeting, arriving late, not following the crowd, because there was none when I got here. Um, I'm, I don't tend to follow the crowd anyway, but um, there's no excuse for not having, and this is the second time this has happened, it happened in North Junior High when the doors were locked. I went to four doors on icy, crunchy, terrible street sidewalk. It was better to walk in the snow because at least I'm dealing with the consistency. And finally somebody coming out of a gym that doesn't even have an outside opening, I got into the building. Um, how simple to have a bucket with sand with a two by four with a sign covered with saran wrap for bad weather that is out near the parking area so people know what door is open, okay? Simple. Enough said. Uh, the second one is a question. I, uh, in this regards, cable and air delivered signal for television. Uh, we have a contract. I am trying to get out of high-rise high housing, which I'm in right now. Um, there's connections for antenna reception and cable reception. I got rid of cable. I can't stand the costs. I have better ways to spend my money. And I'm not, um, I'm busy enough, so I'm not watching that much television. Um, the only thing I miss with antenna reception is community cable. I can get everything else that I can get on basic cable without paying a cost with antenna reception. I've gone to a housing, I've gone to the city hall uh, in, over the phone and um, trying to pursue some things. And what I'd like to know here is uh, I'm ready to go to the, F I've also called the Federal Communications Commission. I want to find out what the law is regarding, and it's in our contract, I'm trying to find out from the city where that contract is, I want to see it, um, because my understanding is, at least when they first had cable, it was a different company, but there was a, um, uh, one of the things that they had to do was supply an over-the-air signal. What I've best been able to find out with little info is that that's the responsibility of the 457s, 27s, 56s, 38s to deliver that signal. I'm not sure that's correct. Uh, I was told uh, by a, a young lady in the office that um, someone would have that. I'd like to find out if somebody here knows who's on that committee, where that contract lies, and how I get to see it. Yeah, um, I can answer that real quick if you want. I sure. We'll be happy to provide you with a copy of the contract. I, because of some questions asked by the council recently, we just uh, dug it out last week from the city solicitor's office, and I actually was reviewing it with Mr. Lindy the other day, and uh, I mean, it's a public document. Anyone can right. have a copy of it. Right. So if you want to uh, just call the mayor's office tomorrow, I'll have them make you a copy of it and make it available to okay. you. Just to prepare you, it's about that thick. That's fine. Uh, okay. I have, uh, as I said, with the Olympics in my game going on right now, I'd love to be home but I, I think the meetings are important regardless of whether I was involved in that. But I, I have a brand new TV. I've tried three TVs. I, I went back to boxes. I bought two because sometimes they fail. I can go through all the menus and I cannot get one over the air signal. So I'm 
really disappointed and disgruntled at this point. Um, the, the last thing I can say is a comment regarding our terrific new superintendent of schools, uh, and that's regarding this language situation. Um, she's just explained tonight about the numbers of people who um, have children who speak foreign languages who are in our system, and the parents don't have that much grasp of the English language. Isn't there some way we can induct a program where even if they can't afford a babysitter and they, even if they're working, where they could go to school at night themselves and get involved? When they have a kid, they automatically go to a class and if the kids have homework and there's no one at home, they can go to that same school and have a room where they can do their studying while mom and dad are both are learning to speak English. If we went back a generation before, our parents, my parents, would be pulling the hair out because they went through it without any of what we have now and um, they and I'm for what's going on but I think this would add a lot to that we wouldn't have to be printing things in 16 languages or having a, a legal lingo that says you got to get this interpreted because we can't do it in 16 languages here it is in English etc cetera, etc cetera. so I don't know if Kathy could address that or well, not I'll answer and then yeah, throw it sure. to the superintendent so the answer is uh, First of all, we do have the, uh, the adult education center that's had the classes right. for a long time. The problem is uh, we get state money to fund that, but it, there's about a two-year waiting list. Uh, the, the superintendent and the school committee piloted a program two years ago at the Huntington School called Family Connections that allows parents right. to come into their own child's school to take ESL classes at almost no cost. It's been a big success since then. We've expanded it to two more schools. It's available in three schools now. And I think it was about two or three days ago the superintendent and I were having a conversation about how we can find some money to expand that to some more schools. And, and I'll. I've delved into the superintendent's area now, so I'll let her respond to that. Thank you. Uh, as the mayor said, we actually just had this conversation Monday in our weekly meeting. Um, it's common sense that, again, parents are connecting with the schools their children go to. We've had a lot of success at the Huntington School. It was called a, one of our focus schools. And one of the first things the principal said to me was, you know, I, I have uh, probably 80% English language learners, or, you know, families where parents do not speak English as their first language. What can we do about that? And we instituted a program, as the mayor said, it was called Family Connections. Not only did we have it in the morning for those parents that possibly work in the evening, we had it in the evening for those parents that were working in the morning. We provided goodies, we provided workbooks for the parents, we provided, as you just mentioned, daycare, which is a big issue for a lot of parents looking to come out to learn English. We've expanded this to East Middle School. Uh, we had money in a grant from the Raymond School. Uh, when the mayor and I talked recently, we're trying to put a price tag on it, and it really is, as you all said, it's priceless to be able to have the pa parents be able to communicate with teachers, with doctors, with members in the community is, is something that we do need to do. So a as far as expanding that program, one of the things I, I'm not sure if I did mention to you, uh, I've, I've hired uh, thank goodness the school committee has supported this, a new grant and development writer. I'm looking at expanding that department because I can't leave a penny on the table. And there is money out there to help us support educating our parents. So this is a program we will uh, you know, be continuing with. I'll, I'll get back to you and hopefully again in a strategic plan we'll talk about how we roll that out, what the price tag is, where do we put you know, those particular schools. I believe the mayor and I were talking about the Baker School which was just just named as one of our focus schools has a large uh, Haitian population and that was one of the first ones we were going to start to take a look at uh, we also have our our noon school named as one of our focus schools we have a large Cape Verdean population there our George school has a large Hispanic population and in the the group that we actually are seeing coming is an Ecuadorian population and these parents are looking looking for ways again to connect with the community so this is a priority and we will be looking at expanding those programs. Thank you, Superintendent. Mr. Lindy. A couple of answers dealing with uh, the question that uh, Mr. Moynihan brought up. Um, as far as the, anything to do with ESL, we just spoke with the mayor's office really recently and we're working with Suzanne Martin over at the Adult Learning Center to try to bring some of those classes to 
to cable television. So that's in the early, early planning stages. So I'm hoping that that's going to happen. It's been a long-term conversation. I think it's going to come to reality. Uh, just to remind everybody, I don't work for the cable company. I work for the nonprofit. But having worked for a cable company, um, there's language in the contract about over the air. There's all sorts of things. The cable advisory board has been dormant for pretty close to the last five years. And that's an issue that would be brought up with them. Councilor Stewart just came over and asked me, is there requirements for over the air transmission? Cable works with cable boxes. Those small cable boxes you have if you don't have a digital TV or an HD TV. Uh, there used to be a provision in the contract where senior citizens could get, or almost anybody could get like 1095 a month, they could get your local access channels, your local broadcast channels. That seems to have been done away by Comcast. There are people that don't have cable. I think a few city councilors uh, may have satellite, okay? And, uh, you know, basically the reason for that is the prices have gone way up. They just announced a price increase. I'm, I'm glad Pat likes the uh, access channels because we try to cover this community. But there needs to be a little bit of pressure put on the cable companies because what's going on is people are cutting the cord and as people go to the internet they go to Hulu they do Chromecast they do all of those things the funding for what we do comes out of the cable contract so if everybody says we're not going to have cable we're in trouble but I think the companies I, I I've been in cable for 30 years okay and what the prices started out with when I was in it, when I started in 1983, um, I think the Brocken price, if I remember correctly, was $7.95 a month. So it's crazy and consumers drive the cost, but right now there's only one game in town. And in the past, the last two administrations, Mayor Harrington, Moses worked in Mayor Harrington's office, tried and tried and tried to get Verizon to come to the table and provide competition. When there is competition among cable companies, usually that levels prices off a little bit. Um, they do not like doing economically disadvantaged cities. Okay, Brockton only has about 60% of the people that have cable television. The other 40% either have DISH or don't have it. Okay, there's a low cost internet component in the schools that Comcast rolled out. They did a big rollout. But the catch to that was you couldn't have any of the services within 90 days. So that affected a lot of people that either had phone or internet and they couldn't get the reduced tier. So um, I used to live uh, for a while um, on Winthrop Street and my neighbor downstairs, the way she knew me before I lived there was she used to see me on cable television. It needs to be addressed again. It's something since the cable contract came up at the council meeting. I've already brought to the mayor's attention. The mayor's the issue authority, the contract. The, you know, I, this needs to be a discussion with Comcast to have some kind of affordable service for the residents of the city of Brockton. Thank you, Mr. Lindy. Mr. Denapoli, Council Denapoli. Thank you. Ma, ma, okay. We, th can you, everybody hear me? Turn the mic on. Okay. Uh, uh, Pat, I, I have a... It's not going to help. Patrick, I, to address the issue on the table, uh, on cable, Okay, years ago the system was an analog system. Mm -hmm. it, right now it's digital. When they went to the digital broadcasting and televisions were requested to go to a digital broadcast, the old system was thrown out. They don't have to give you anything right now. Everything is digital, you have to pay for digital. Everybody understands? So when you're watching TV now, sometimes the picture breaks up in little blocks. That's a digital broadcast. You know, years ago I used to watch a black and white TV. That's what they had. But today, it's high definition. You can see raindrops happening. And years ago, the cable company did have tiers where you could put your television right onto the cable line without a box and get basic cable. That's gone. Okay, and if Comcast gets their own way when they buy uh, turn one, Time Warner, for, forget about competition, right. folks. Right. right, I mean, like Mark said, years ago, basic cable in Brockton was 20 bucks. And on Ron Van Dam's show, he says he pays what, 240 bucks a month for cable mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. which is it's crazy. It's 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 out of sight, but what are your priorities? You know, everybody watches TV, so you're you're hooked, you know, but that's what it is. Everybody has uh, a a high definition, de def, uh, high definition television today. You need the cable box to uh, to watch TV. So I just want to address that. Thank the you. old system's gone. The new system is in. Thank you, Councillor. If anybody has any questions, please come forward. Who's 
one little addition to what that Ladies gentleman first. was talking about. <laughs> Tom. Mr. Attorney Monaghan, uh, yeah. School Committee Monaghan just had one more follow up on that. No, I'm sorry, Minicello. Yeah, you know I'm on. I'm a lot better looking than this. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, it's getting late. <laughs> just, just addressing that gentleman's question about um, engagement of uh, families who don't speak English. Um, that again is something that we've been looking into and. Adding the grant position, you saw in the paper the other night that there's been some, some uh, positions that have been added. Well, these positions that have been added are well thought positions. The grant person is going to pay for that person's salary and then some, and also allow us to broaden our basically our, our, our grasp and get into these different areas of importance to the city. Another area is the dropout rate. We have alternative programs that we have initiate, initiated so that we're engaging kids who have dropped out of school or where Brockton High is not the right avenue for them and they need a different environment because if these kids disengage in school, what are they going to do on the streets of Brockton? We all know what they're going to do on the streets of Brockton. It's not going to be good for them. It's not going to be good for anybody. So we, we are trying to be smart on the school side in terms of positions. Positions that are going to pay for itself, positions that are going to pay for other positions, and positions that are going to allow us to broaden the reach to kids and families that are basically going to have a positive impact overall on our city. Engagement of people that don't speak English as their primary language and engagement of kids that are dropping out or need some nudging in the right direction to get re-engaged. So. Thank you Mr. Minicello. Ma'am. Seems like you're getting all the seniors uh, at the end. Um, this, you're talking about Vicente's Grocery going up at the corner of Pleasant Street and Warren Avenue. Are they going to remain in Campello as well? Yes. Oh, that's nice. That's it's very a, it's nice. A, it's a true expansion. They're going to keep their present spot, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's a, it's a real strong TIF proposal because it legitimately adds jobs and it will also increase the taxes we collect on that property over a period of time. But they, they are committed to keeping the store on, on, on South Main Street also. That's excellent. I think that'll be a great addition to the city. It will. It'll clean up that corner. It's, it, it, it works in about 10 different ways, yeah, absolutely. And people need a grocery store to go to. We haven't had a downtown grocery yeah. store for a long time. And yeah. it's, poor, uh, it's poor a, people need to go buy groceries as well. Well, and don't forget, we're adding hundreds of residential units to the downtown also that will also be customers I'm, for that I'm store. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch that. And so we're also adding hundreds of units of housing to right. the downtown over the next couple of years. And those are additional customers to start shop there also. I think they'll be very successful. They're also um, the company that um, gave a, um, there's a, a, a group out of Trinity Baptist Church that um, helps prisoners when they get out of prison. I think it's called Compassion or something along that line. Yeah, it's a reentry program. Yeah. And, right, and they matched uh, funds for, that private people would give and mm -hmm. they match funds. So I think that was a very nice thing for them to do. But I also wanted to ask, where is that Cumberland Farms going into on the uh, east side? You know where the, the fire station is? Yep. Directly across the street, the old okay. mutual gas station, the okay. old uh, Mr. Donut. Yep. They're taking that whole block. Okay, that, cool. that'll be very nice. And we'll, the north side will be just as nice when they put the north right. side. Right. And also, I know where the, that international restaurant is. I understand where that is. What was the third place that you mentioned? The other toilets going into side lights. Okay. Well, he came up. That's excellent. Two businesses. Right. Right. No, that's very good. Now, my, my question is to the mayor and maybe to the school. school. I thought that was the question. <laughs> oh, no, what's that? You have another question? Yeah, I have yeah. another <laughs> um, where would you plan to put the university downtown uh, in all those vacant buildings? Um, we're, they're actually, uh, that's why we're having the meeting with DCAM. There are actually three different models, three different ways to possibly do this. And Representative Cronin was already working on this before I got here. And I'm happy she's letting me jump on the team now. But um, one of the university, uh, state DCAM could acquire a site and renovate it. One of the building authorities of one of the colleges could acquire a site, renovate it, and then lease out some of the space to the other two schools. Or 
we get a private developer to develop a building and have DCAM lease the space for the schools. That model is my first choice because we continue to collect property taxes on the building under that model. We don't on the other two. Uh, what we've done to prepare for the upcoming meeting with DCAM is I've actually made an inventory of all properties in the downtown area that the city has either acquired through tax title or they're in the process of acquiring through tax title. And most of these buildings are in rough shape. And uh, our intent with this is not just to bring the campus downtown, but to hopefully take at least one and possibly two buildings that are in really bad shape and by being able to put them into this program, get them completely renovated and, and be brought back online as modern new college buildings. Um, my first choice would be the Ganley building, which is the one when you come to the end of Belmont Street and look straight in front of you. Um, but that's one of half a dozen downtown sites we're going to talk to DCAM about. And at the end of the day, I just want to get it done. Whatever model it takes to get it done, we just have to get it done. What universities are you looking at? Massasoit, Bridgewater State, and UMass Boston all coming together in a partnership. It makes it really cutting edge. It, it'll be a model that'll be copied across the country to have three different public schools with affordable programs and the curriculums will be all intertwined so that Massasoit be, would be bringing down first and second year classes. The other two schools would bring down third and fourth year classes. Um, and I, we think it's a, it's a very exciting model. I've met with two of the college presidents already and I'm meeting with the third one next week. Sounds like a very, very good idea. And it, Representative Cronin has really done a lot of work on this before I got here. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, Claire, do you want to address it? Because you really have been a so leader on it. I'm going to Mike Brady as well. Okay, all right. I don't want to leave all right. The entire, I'm sorry, the entire delegation. It, it is the entire it's delegation. The delegation after yeah. and Representative Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Matter. Have we had a time? <laughs> 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 I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> I'm glad you uh, you're, uh, appreciate me coming, Mr. Morning. Uh, my question is in regards to transparency, uh, which I find in this city doesn't exist. I have, especially when it comes to uh, discrimination cases against the city of Brockton, which there are many, and I have tried desperately to get information from the law department. I've been stonewalled. They won't give me the information, and it's not just the law department, it's other departments. It's, I mean, I've, I've had to go to the Secretary of State a number of times, and I just feel that we the people should know what's going on, especially when it comes to yep. discrimination cases. Can I, can I give you a quick response, Ron, then I'll let you continue? Because uh, this may be timely for you. The Enterprise filed uh, an information request about a week ago with the city uh, asking for a list of all litigation that involves the city of Brockton on either side of it, which would include all the cases that you have. Um, and I've instructed the city solicitor's office to comply with that request, and they're working on it now. And I forget, I think the law gives us 30 days or something like that. But ten. Supposedly yet, ten. Ten days. Whatever it is. Ten I, days I've, from the day of the request. Right. I've, I've directed the solicitor's office to comply with the request. And when that list is done, <laughs> besides sending it to the enterprise, I'll be happy to provide it to any other citizen that wants it. Okay, thank you. I, I suspect the enterprise will put it in the newspaper anyhow. But, <laughs> but if you'd like a list in the meantime before the paper comes out, uh, we are working on compi uh, com complying with the request and it, whatever we come up with for the response will be a public document. Yeah, because it should be because I believe it's costing the city of Brockton millions of dollars. Yep. I mean, they just settled one suit for 300000 of uh, 390000 I believe. Right. And, and nobody knows about this thing. Nobody, uh, you know, I want it out in the open. Yeah. I want the city of, uh, you know, the people of the city of Brockton know what this, their city government is doing and how they're complying with these yep. things. It's, it's, it, it's a uh, fair and reasonable request, and I agree with you that all the citizens should be aware of uh, any litigation that the city's involved in. Could I add to that as well? Uh, after sure. uh, Mr. Matta. Uh, after our conversation and your concerns about transparency, yes. it, also, it also had me think about something else, which is what can the city do uh, to prevent 
our getting involved in lawsuits to begin with. So I, I will be uh, filing a resolve. I'm doing a bit of research now and speaking with our legal advisor on um, what types of programs that insurance companies offer, uh, what programs exist independently from insurance companies. There are typically training programs, but let's do a quick assessment of what types of civil rights lawsuits are being filed against the city and then what types of programs exist already for training up municipal staff to make certain they're um, you know, within the law uh, in terms of interacting with residents to make certain we don't get ourselves in those in those situations. So that's something that, uh, frankly, you um, you <coughs> inadvertently spearheaded um, and helped me get off the ground. And that's something that will be coming before the city council in the next month or so. Uh, well, I definitely know that the, the city workers, a lot of them have to be uh, retrained in public relations because right now it doesn't look All of that. good. All of that. But uh, yeah, we should do that. And I I agree. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Matter. Thank you. Good evening, Jackie. Hi, everybody. Um, three kind of three topics. I'll be quick because it's late. Uh, first of all, uh, Mayor, I'm heartened that you're getting together with the people from Lowell. Um, I'm on the state committee. I was up at the convention in Lowell, and um, the downtown was amazing. Amazing, and I kept saying we need this in Barkton. We need to um, open up that ordinance so we can have outside seating. I've been telling Monahan this for a long time. Outside seating for restaurants, okay, downtown. Um, I've been to the North End. I walked there. I said, why can't we have this in Barkton? So we need all those Italian restaurants. No, I mean, we need it. <laughs> no, but we, we need to have it vitalized. So um, thank you very much. That's going to be great. So. Um, anyway, get we'll that have ordinance. To change the ordinances to do that. That's I know that. That's what I said. Change the ordinances. Okay, that's topic number one. Topic number two, which you brought up, and I'm very happy, is about the Narcan being with the firemen. Um, uh, the city weeks. of Quincy and the city of um, Boston are now having Narcan with the police. So I'm asking, let's get the police next because yeah. the firemen don't always get to these. Well, um, but if I, if I can respond to that, um, I started working on this the first week after I was sworn in, and, and the police thing was certainly looked at. For Brockton right now, Brockton's a little unique that in Brockton, the fire department responds to all of anything that's a 911 call that's medical. They're always the first ones there. So yes, could there be an occasion that a police officer might stumble into an overdose situation? Yes, but when the calls come in 911, it's the fire department responding. They're the first ones there. They're better equipped by their training because they're all EMTs, which the police officers are not. And the only reason we're not already doing this is we had to go through a little process with uh, DPH and Hillary Dubois over at the Opioid Overdose Task Force. Uh, worked very closely um, with Corin Capiello in my office. And I really want to give some credit to Fire Chief Francis, who was very receptive, has been 100% supportive. The union has, has not had no objection to it. And uh, the, the only remaining time in the telling me within two weeks is just that every single firefighter has to be trained in the proper administration of it and that's supposed to be starting right around now great thank you and the third quick thing is um, the plows did a fabulous job yes. except except <laughs> I live in a curve and they can't seem to get close so it's like eight feet out so it took me three hours the other day to plow went out to get medicine for my daughter I saw the plow driver I said can you please you know get a little closer for my neighbor and I especially I come back he plowed my neighbor and I in and um, sh my neighbor 80 years old was she was shoveling my property so after she shoveled her own. So I'm a woman, I'm doing it. She, there are women next door. That was nasty. I, nasty, nasty. You need to tell You need to tell the plow drivers, please don't do that. If you file a complaint, Thank we'll you. look into it. And along that line, I've had a real education in snow removal because we're a million dollars in the hole. Um, yeah. And I didn't spend all of it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, did, I didn't spend a 
a lot of it, great. actually. The streets are great, really. They no, but we are, we are already working with the legal department and, 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 and beginning initial conversations, both the unions and the outside contractors. I want GPS and all the snow removal equipment next Fabulous. year. Fabulous. Thank and you And that way, much. when an issue like that comes up, we'll be able to track very easily and see if there was a piece of equipment, Good. what piece of equipment was there, and exactly what time, what location. And if I'm paying 150 bucks an hour for a piece of contracted equipment, I think where the city has a right to know exactly how long they were in Brockton and where they were for what we paid them Great. for. And the other thing is, you know, I wish I knew what you said about, you know, property, because I had a toilet left on my property a couple of years ago, and I didn't know who to call. So, but thank you for letting me know. Should have called Tom, he would have gotten it. <laughs> yeah. I used toilet on my property, but thank you. Anyway. Thank you, Jackie. Anybody else? Mr. Williams. Good evening. Good evening, how are you doing? Good, thank you, and yourself? All right, I'm well, I'm well, thank you. I just wanted to speak uh, regarding three things, really quick. A uh, couple of underserved populations. One, I'm a father of four here in Brockton. Three of my children are in the school system. One goes here, one at the George School that will be going here, two at the George School, one which will be going here next year. Uh, and one, just wait till you get him. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot of programs being built in, over the recent years and being brought into the, pro, into the city, uh, getting OJJDP money and, and getting money for, for kids that are WIA eligible so that they can have summer jobs and, and the STRIVE program which paid I believe 20 kids last year $1,000 to, uh, to go to some sort of programming over the summer. But I want to be representative of kids like my kids. You know, honor roll students uh, who do what they're supposed to do, um, who attend school every day, but when it comes to receiving summer jobs and things like that, there's nothing for them. They, they have no resources over the summer um, to get a summer job, to get that type of training, unless they have some sort of connection to someone and, and can slide in somewhere at a market or something like that. There are a lot of uh, our youth who are not being served properly. And to me, it leads to a lot of them, upon leaving and going to college, not returning to Brockton. And we don't get back those resources, those key resources, which are our young people that we have put as a school committee, as a, as a school system. We've put a lot of time, a lot of energy, uh, a lot of resources into them and in, in developing them. And we should be able to, you know, reap the benefits of what they become. Uh, also, uh, I want to speak to the school committee about mentoring programs and instituting them on the level of, the, on the junior high level. Uh, I myself have created and run a mentoring program in Southeastern Regional Vogue Tech. It's been very successful. Uh, we had one student that was on the honor roll last year when we went in in the third term. Uh, one of the 25 students that are in our program. First, ter first term this year, we had 10 students on the honor roll. Uh, and they're developing into, into better students. We're bridging the gaps with uh, regards to uh, parents coming into schools and us reaching out to parents. We're bridging a lot of gaps with in-school mentoring programs. You, will, you won't find one like this. I've actually studied in-school mentoring programs. I have a research paper called The Effects of uh, Mentoring on Urban Males. Uh, and the, the effect is tremendous and it's just growing and developing into something great and I think it's something that you should look at and in getting into the junior highs because all of my students come from Brockton. One does not live in Brockton anymore but all of my students went to a junior high school in Brockton and some of the issues that we are seeing with these students, um, females um, having sex at the junior high level uh, and coming into our program and, and kids being involved with drugs in the junior highs and some some of these things can be avoided. Uh, the last uh, demographic that I would like to represent is one that's near and dear to me um, and I would like to preface it by saying uh, I've been home from prison. I've done six years in prison in the Mass uh, Department of Corrections and since I've come home I've run for city council at large against some of some of you. Uh, I've we want you to run again, John. I've I've campaigned for some of you. Uh, I've 
volunteered at multiple organizations in the city. I've worked for the city. I've worked for the YMCA. Uh, I've done a lot of things and put a lot of time, and it eventually led to me developing my own program to help youth and help my city grow into a, a better city for the future. Uh, but at the same time, I couldn't go get a job at McDonald's today if I wanted to. I couldn't get a job at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I heard uh, Mayor Carpenter speak about a lot of returning convicts coming home from incarceration from the Andy Dugan thing. And the truth is, over 90% of convicts that go into prison will be returning back to a community someday. And what are they returning back to? And what skills are we looking to provide them with? And I would like to, to ask, is there anything that the city is doing yeah. to provide I programming? I know in certain cities, certain larger cities with, with worse uh, crime rates, Baltimore, Chicago, Detroit, they have programs that are started by convicts that essentially give the city a stamp of approval to a guy that goes through that program and says he's ready. He's ready to, to re-enter society. He is ready to do what needs to be done. Because there are individuals, I can say for myself, uh, I've established a great reputation for myself in anything that I've done. Uh, I've established myself as a moral and upright gentleman of character in everything that I do, not only uh, when I'm out in the public, but I have double the reputation out in the streets as a moral person. Uh, and there are a lot of individuals who have come home already from, from the Annie Dugan thing, who have been in touch with me, and they, they've asked me, what can I do? What can I do to help my city? What can I do to be involved? I need a job, because when they come home, they have families just as you do, and they would like to work, they would like to do things to get engaged with not only helping their city, but first and foremost, helping their homes. And I know for myself, if I was not able to provide for my children, I don't know where I would be mentally, I don't know what I would be doing. So a lot of these guys, we can say, all right, up the police force and, and, and do all these things, but the truth is a lot of these guys are coming home to do good things, and they need to be able to have a medium to do those things through. Thank you very much for your yeah. time. You want this one, Bill? Yeah. So, John, I think you might find this interesting. So I, I agree with you 100%, and, and when we, we look at all the different techniques to reduce crime in the city. Investing in re-entry programs is absolutely a good investment. And so one of the things Chief Hayden has done just in the two weeks he's been here is because of relationships he has in the state level, uh, we've already met with the state uh, probation and uh, we've already begun working on a grant application to the state that could bring three quarters of a million dollars for a re-entry program for the city of Brockton that will include education, vocational training, job placement, um, and I've already, as I've been traveling even this morning with some of the business leaders I met with this morning, informally I am already talking to Brockton employers about being Corey friendly and giving people a second chance. Because the people we're going to give a second chance to are going to earn the second chance by participating in a program and accepting certain amounts of responsibility. Um, I'm actively looking at different models that work in other communities. Um, and uh, through Pastor Walker at Messiah Baptist, I've met the Reverend Dr. Cardwell, who has a very successful program in Virginia uh, that has just been expanded to six different counties and prisons now by the Commonwealth of Virginia because of the success he has. He has a faith-based aspect to it, but what's really interesting about his reentry program and why I'm interested in it is one of the foundations of it is, is reestablishing relationships between offenders and their children and, and giving, um, giving uh, people who are incarcerated uh, a second chance at having a sta uh, relationships with their children, beginning with closed circuit TV visits while people are still incarcerated and then expanding that and what they're finding is a much higher higher rate of not reoffending if someone gets re-engaged with their kids. Um, so I think getting engaged with your kids is a piece. I think job skills is a piece. I think education is a piece. And I think most importantly, all those other things won't work if you can't help someone find a job. And if they can't get a job and make money, then they're going to go back to making money the old way. So, um, you know, 
we absolutely, you know, today in the city, if someone's carrying an illegal gun or they're selling drugs, we are going to arrest them. Uh, but at the same token, um, we are going to work very actively when people have, have paid the penalty uh, and want a second chance. We're going to work very hard to create that second chance for them and be willing to reinvest some money in that um, because I think that we can help a lot of people um, not reoffend if we have the right things in place. So um, that's an initiative that I'm, I'm actively working on as part of our overall anti-crime plan. Thank you, Mr. Mann. John, you brought up a good point about uh, summer employment to kids that are on a roll, and I, that makes sense. I mean, of course, money's tight, but back in the day, you had kids that were A students and C and D students, and believe me, I know the C and D students. Um, and you know, oh yeah, ask my mom and dad. But but you would uh, you'd be able to work in the summer park program, or be a lifeguard at the city pools, and. And so we need to work as elected officials locally and with the state officials that we have as well, and of course the mayor, to try to formulate a plan because I concur with you on that. So thank you again. Mr. Curtis. Well, can I just follow mayor. up on well, well, let me just follow up on the council real quick, Larry. Um, we actually are working on bringing back a summer park parks program for younger kids this summer. We're working in partnership um, with the schools and with the existing Brockton After Dark. And what we're looking at for this summer is um, four playgrounds, kids ages seven through 12, which would be the younger yeah. kids below 13 and up that are in the nighttime Brockton After Dark program. We don't have a snazzy name for it yet, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a Brockton After Dark Day program for kids ages 7 through 12. It addresses a lot of issues. We've got kids in that age group that are left home alone during the day in the summertime because their parents are, parents are working. It provides a safe haven. It provides fitness, health, and exercise. Um, we're going to have the school lunch program serving a free lunch to every kid in the program every day, Monday through Friday, at four different playgrounds. Um, but it also provides summer jobs. We're going to hire high school seniors and college students who will work as camp counselors, give them a summer job, but it also creates something else you alluded to. It also becomes a mentoring program um, because those are kids that are on the right track, on their way to college, or already in college, while they're working with the younger kids, also serving as positive role models, uh, interacting with those kids. So it's a win on about six different levels. Um, I'd love to do more, but we're going to launch it in four playgrounds this summer. Like everything else, you have to find the money, um, but we're putting that together without asking for any money out of the budget. We're, we're identifying some different sources um, for the funding, and I'm, I'm really excited about it, and uh, we're going to ask the community to support it in a big way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, ladies and gentlemen, due to the, the lateness of the hour, um, you know, we started at 7 o'clock, and, and again, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. I want to thank my colleagues here on the local level that serve on the school committee, Southeastern Regional, uh, of course, the mayor and the city council, and of course, State Rep Mike Brady, State Rep Claire Cronin, uh, Senator Tom Kennedy joined us tonight, and Kathleen Smith, our, our fine superintendent. We are going to be having another one of these uh, quarterly meetings. Um, I'll, I'll be working with the mayor and Mr. Minicello. I suspect it's going to be in May because we want to do it prior into the summer months. Uh, it will probably be at East Middle School. I'm going to say that now. So again, thank you. Um, again, we're going to have another one. We're going to have three more of these before the end of the calendar year. Brian? Sure, sir. Mr. Mayor, uh, my name is Brian Carver. For those of you who don't know me, um, before I start, I want to thank Captain Smith for what she's done for me personally. This may be a selfish thing, but it could happen to anyone you can. There was an incident that happened back in November that my child was accused of doing something at the high school to another student. The, I called up my school committee member. I called up the principal of the high school. Um, I called up the superintendent's office. Everybody told me, uh, nothing we can do about it. It's a police matter. My kid was accused of something, doing something wrong. He wasn't convicted. He was accused of it. So because nobody willing to step forward and help us out or talk to us, this kid's an A student, great education in the Brockton Public Schools. I'm appreciative of that. The Brockton Police Department came down with seven officers to my home and arrested this kid. 
100 pounds soaking wet in molasses on a, on a student, vice president of the high school class. Uh, he did nothing wrong uh, because this person accused him of doing it, uh, teachers accused him of doing it, administrators accused him of doing it. Now my kid has a record. My kid's filing uh, to go to BU next year. BU returned his application because he has a criminal record. What's the answer? Where's my help? Where was my help? I'm here for you guys. I'm here for the city. I'm here for my schools. I asked Eileen Campbell, you know, uh, principal of the Davis School. I've been there 10 years. You know, asked uh, Buckley, you know, chief of staff. My kids, he said my kids. You know, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it must be a duck. If my kid's a good kid, goes to school every day, honor roll student, class president, or vice president, excuse me, they, you, you can't, you just can't do that. You know, Patty Joyce, I asked you, you told me there was nothing you could do for me because it was a police matter. There was something you could have did for me. You could have brought it up. Nobody did it. Nobody. That's not true. It's, but it's a private matter, I'm not and I'm not going to argue with you in public. Brian, uh, with that being said, you, but you, you did thank the superintendent for assisting you. She's been she excellent. Over back was helping me out. Okay. John Jerome also. Okay. John's a great guy as well. Yes. But the same token, there's still things that aren't done. You know, there's a teacher at the high school, there's like one of these classes happening, telling her student she wants her husband killed. Well, we, again, that's hearsay. We can't talk about that here. It's not hearsay. It's a fact. Oh. I'm telling you as a fact. Another parent called me today uh, uh, saying her daughter did, uh, said the same thing. But I, the principal and the housemaster say nobody collaborated on my kid's story. This parent says he did. This teacher wanted the, uh, the student out of her class. The teacher said to her, the student was called down to the uh, offices and said, tell us in confidentiality. Well, teacher found out. Teacher told the student, this, this honorable student in the 12th grade, that I don't want you in my class anymore. I can't trust you. Brian, is this a pending legal matter or is it solved? Oh, it's all over. It's all over. Yeah, okay. my kid has a criminal record. I'm $22,000 in the hole for legal fees because nobody willing to help me. Is That's it college? Hopefully. God willing, hopefully. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, I, I want to thank each and every one of you for braving the, uh, the weather. Uh, and again, we're going to have another one of these, I'd say, likely in May. I want to thank uh, the mayor and, and, and everybody else that's here tonight. I'm going to entertain a motion to adjourn. Second to move. Motion to emerge. Second, properly seconded. Meeting's here by adjourned.